Hello, dear misfits. We survived Christmas, and now we're preparing for the end of 2023. We do hope you're with a family or a dog or cat, and you're cozy in your bed, waiting to be spooked by some horror stories. So before we start our show, do subscribe. And now... Story time. My dad lives in West Virginia. I'm from Alaska and have lived here most of my life. While visiting my dad in 1995 or 1996, I was walking through the woods. Something large took off from a tree above me. I've seen some big birds. This was the biggest bird I've ever seen. For scale, eagles, albatross, and sandhill cranes are common on the Kenai Peninsula, where I'm from, but this was bigger. Way bigger. And the wings were leathery. I told my dad and he laughed and said I startled moth man, but really it was probably just a buzzard. I don't think it was and at the time I didn't think it was moth man, but maybe it was. I know people that cross the Chihuahuan desert, they would tell me of tall winged figures with red eyes that would follow them on occasion. Their coyote would always advise them to not look at the figures because some that did would become paralyzed with fear. Also if you google Cahokia Birdman you will find that at the ancient Pyramid Mound complex at St. Louis, they excavated several pendants and tablet carvings of a man with wings, perhaps a religious cult centered around this creature that goes back a thousand years? Not my own story, but one of my colleagues, a park ranger who's been doing this for a long time, told me about an incident while escorting some boy scouts out of the park at night to get them to their cars. He had to cross a creek that was roughly four feet deep and just over three feet wide. As he approached the water's edge with his flashlight, there were large sounds from both sides of him, growling from up in the surrounding cliffs. It sounded something like a big bear and a wolf but much deeper. He told me it was the scariest thing he's ever heard, even though they weren't exactly close. He knew whatever it was sounded big, and it was not going to let him pass without taking a swipe at him or potentially chasing him off. So, he angled his flashlight beam to light up the water's surface, shouted at the boys crossing, stay away from the edge of the creek. Hurry or we'll be here all night and they got across safely by jumping. As soon as they were out of sight, he heard a loud crashing sound in front of him. He kept shining his light straight away but never saw anything. He got the sense that whatever it was was trying to stay hidden in the darkness. He didn't think much about it, though, until a few years later when I asked if he's ever seen anything creepy after dark. He said, no way whatsoever. I've been doing this for years, and there is something very spooky about that stretch of land, especially past sunset. In fact, the following summer, yet another ranger was going to check on a family, a mom, dad, and son, all hikers, and he thought they were still out near the same area. When he got close enough to their campsite, he saw all three sets of tent footprints coming across the creek but only one set going back into the woods. He found them all dead, and he had to write down that it was an attempted mauling by a bear, but they had been partially eaten on. That's the ranger that I was emailing you about prior who had sent me a photo taken up at sunset. Even that boy scout troop leader said what he saw resembled what looked to be a large wolf, and he believes it's the infamous Michigan dogman. Anyway, you really don't want to go camping in these parts at night. The woods just are not really safe anymore. Me and my cousin back in 1994. We were both outside playing, riding bikes, etc. We looked up because we saw a big human-like bird fly above us lower than the palm trees that were in front of my cousin's house. I remember it had just got dark outside so we could still see the blue sky above us, so it wasn't completely dark. It was a huge person with very large wings. It didn't look at us. It just flew above us and we both looked at each other and ran inside and told our parents but they, of course, didn't believe us. 
We are both 36 years old now and we both remember this vividly. Well, the eyes were glowing reddish orange like a furnace, and the height was closer to 8 feet. Very broad shoulders or the wings made it look like that. The silhouette was blacker than the night sky behind it. It was 1985 and I was 19 years old just sitting on the lounge chair watching TV when I had a feeling someone was outside in the backyard. So, I pulled the curtain back and saw this being and it sent an immediate flight, no pun intended, response to my brain. As fear turned into anger as I got out of the chair and headed into the kitchen. I got two knives holding blades towards my elbows and headed into the backyard. I saw nothing, but the air was colder in that spot where I saw it and there were no crickets or anything making noises. This sighting occurred in Tempe, Arizona. My two cents worth. For some background info, I was raised in the desert southeast of New Mexico on two different ranches, so I am very well versed in the flora and fauna of our beautiful state. I even used to track semi-professionally for hunters and our local trapper. I know the critters around this state. We always lived on very remote ranches, sometimes 50, even 75 miles from the nearest actual town. In my senior year of high school, I moved out on my own being a part of the DECA program, to live closer to my job and school. Living about 12 miles from Artesia NM, where my school and job were, seemed like living right in town after all of that. I guess my story starts in April of 1999. My boyfriend and I were rooming with a couple in a trailer house just outside of Lakewood NM. We rented a room from them and sometimes watched their two kids as part of our rental agreement. For a few weeks that April, a lot of the neighboring landowners had been complaining about wild dogs coming up from the river and harassing their dogs and scaring their livestock. We were about a mile from the Pecos River, and wild dogs have indeed been a problem in the area. One guy had even reported some structural damage to one of his chicken coops. The couple we lived with had two dogs, both of them medium-sized terrier mixes, and neither one of them was on the cowardly side. They had been getting very skittish about going outside at night, though. So much so that we had to make sure to let them out right at sunset and again at sunrise because they would not leave the trailer house otherwise at night. One Saturday night, at about 11 p.m., I know it was a Saturday because I had neither work nor school, near the end of the month, the four of us were sitting around watching TV and just basically talking about stuff when the dogs who were asleep in the master bedroom on the far east side of the house, started growling and barking at the window on the south wall of the bedroom. This was really unusual behavior for them, so we all got up to see what they were on about. By the time we got there, the dogs had shifted their barking away from the window and seemed to be barking at the wall and along the wall, like they could smell something there, but it was moving. It was very strange and when they came up to the end of the room, their barking just went crazy. Suddenly, from farther down the wall, at the same time, about where the kitchen was, we all heard this loud thump and scuffling sound. It was powerful enough that we actually felt it, with it being an 80 times 16 trailer house and all. The dogs, at this point, just completely lost it. They cried out a high-pitched whine and just dove under the bed. We all ran out of the bedroom, down the hall, and into the kitchen to see what the heck was up. Peering out the kitchen window was pointless, as it was late, there was cloud cover, and the moon wasn't even out. We heard the scuffling noise again, from further down the house, and went into the living room to see what was up. We were all really confused at this point. The next few moments seemed to happen in slow motion appearing in the living room window from the left and looking right in on us from the glass was. I don't know what. From the shoulders up was what I can only describe as a man dog. Its shoulders were quite human, with short sleek hair, but it had the head of what looked to be a Rottweiler. And the teeth. Oh my god. The teeth on this thing. All four of us screamed at about the same time, and I guess that scared it off because it just disappeared. 
That image is forever seared into my head. Also of note, this was a trailer house, so the bottom of that window was easily six feet off the ground, meaning this thing was seven foot something. No matter how big of a dog or wolf it was, it could not have stood up and looked at us like that, in that window. The guys, being guys, immediately grabbed their shotguns and headed out the door, even though I told them it was a bad idea. Super dark desert night? Big unknown critter? Uck, no, I guess they were out there looking around for it for about 20 minutes before they came back inside and said they couldn't see anything. The light from the house shining on it and it being so close to the window were the only reasons we saw it in the first place. None of us really slept well that night. It just felt creepy. The next morning, I got up early and decided to go have a look around to see if there were any tracks to identify what the heck it was. The grass and weeds that were right beside the house pretty much hit any tracks it made there. Although, I did find where it looked as if something had clawed at the siding, along the bottom of the house, in a couple of places, making the thump and scuffling sounds the night before. I then decided to follow the tracks the guys had made, and that was when I made a second, very unnerving discovery. The guys made clear tracks in the sandy dirt, and whatever it was out there did as well because it was pretty much circling them the entire time they were out there, at a distance of about 40 feet. The tracks were huge, canine, and switched back and forth from four tracks to two, meaning it was walking bipedally for at least half the time it circled them. Just freaking creepy. My friend and I saw the Mothman in January 2012 in my hometown, Mexico City. It was terrifying. The next morning we thought it wasn't real but got it real when my neighbors told me they saw it too over my house. We thought it was a weird alien with wings. When I moved to the USA, I realized the Mothman was the same creature we saw. I still think of that today. I live in Warwickshire, United Kingdom. Earlier this year, Jan or February 2023, I was standing outside having a cigarette and observed what I thought was a large black bird or even hang glider darting in and out of the clouds, almost playfully back and forth, which looked really odd. I'm a bit of a plane buff so this really grabbed my attention, it was midday, so I grabbed my binoculars and basically saw a mothman but with more clearly defined legs and a faster wing beat. I'd estimate it was about a mile or so away and looked pretty big. I watched it for about 5 minutes before it flew into the clouds. It kind of looked for one of better words like a black angel and did make me feel uneasy at the time. I found this very strange journal when I was hiking in Yellowstone last summer. Normally I wouldn't even bother to mention it, but when I found it just sitting off the edge of the walkway around the big hot springs, I was curious. It was one of those really classic leather-bound journals, and I love all of those rustic styles. After picking it up, I looked around at the crowd of people roaming across the walkways, thinking maybe someone just dropped it, but no one looked like they were looking for something. I even shouted that I found it, hoping the owner would come for it, but after getting a few strange looks, I figured the owner was long gone. At this point I was very curious as to what was in it, and I figured I might find some information to allow me to locate the owner, so I thumbed through it. What I found was shocking. Now, initially I thought it was just a story. You know, kind of like those creepypastas they have on Reddit, but as I continued to read, it was clear that this was not just a creepy story. Something is going on at Yellowstone, and I think everyone needs to know, before it's too late. What I am about to tell you may sound like flat-out insanity, or someone trying to play a joke, but I swear, this is real. After I read the entire journal, I was thinking the same thing. I thought it was just a story, then even tried to brush it off as a joke, but my curiosity got the better of me, so I looked into it, and I even spent the rest of my vacation investigating the information in this journal. I mean if it was real, I had to know, 
or at least calm my fears and worries. What I found was far more terrifying than I had even imagined. Let's get back to the journal. It was written by a gift shop worker named Sarah who worked at the old Faithful Basin store. She wrote that she was very friendly and would often chat with the customers about their vacations and such. She was so well liked apparently that she often got repeat visits from customers, sometimes just before they would leave, or because they felt comfortable with her and she was honest. Whatever it was, Sarah was definitely not a wallflower by any means. She wrote that she began to notice visitors disappearing. She started to get concerned when visitors would ask about their missing relatives, although there were no missing persons listed in the daily bulletin. Apparently the day after they would be chastised for breaking a park rule by a park ranger, they would mysteriously disappear. Sarah wrote that the visitors would tell her that they reported their friend or family member missing to the park rangers, and a few hours later would be told that they were seen leaving the park. Yet the customers would often say they tried calling their missing companion, but just couldn't get a hold of them. She tried to calm their fears by telling them that there was often terrible cell service due to the mountains. Her worries started to grow as more and more people would go missing, yet not a single one of them would show up on the missing reports. It was at this point when she started to look into this strange event. Sarah began offering to keep a lookout for the missing person and traded phone numbers with the frantic families. Now I know what you are thinking. I looked into missing persons reports at Yellowstone, and none of the people listed missing in the journal are listed in the missing persons registry at the park. Not a single one of those people that she described is listed as missing in the park, yet the families, swear up and down that they went missing in the park. I even asked, myself when I called the Yellowstone Park Service claiming to be a journalist, and every time I mentioned one of the missing, and I mean every time, I was informed that particular person was seen leaving the park. Clearly there was more to this than the Park Service was willing to admit. I had decided to spend the rest of my summer vacation looking into this issue. Okay so back to the journal. In the next section of the journal, Sarah said she started to look into these missing persons with a greater intensity, spending her evenings researching each individual, trying to find any connections or links between them. She started questioning a few park rangers, asking simple questions such as, have you heard about this person? Their family said they went missing from campground A? And did you happen to see this person actually leave the park? After a couple of weeks of questioning the visitor disappearances, she came home to find a note pinned to her front door. When she read the note, she was shocked to find stop looking, you wouldn't want to lose that precious job you seem to love so much. This however only served to solidify her determination to investigate the disappearances. Clearly this wasn't just a tourist lost in the miles of park. Something sinister was actually going on. After a couple of weeks of investigating and finding no real leads, Sarah happened to overhear a couple of park rangers talking. Their hushed discussion seemed unusual, prompting her to decide to follow them at the end of her shift. As soon as her shift ended, with her mind almost entirely focused on the mystery, she didn't even notice when she almost slammed into the back of same two rangers she overheard earlier, and after cheerfully saying something like oh I am so sorry, I didn't see you. I will see you tomorrow, have a great night, she shuffled away quickly in the direction of the parking lot, as if to go to her car. The rangers seemed to ignore her presence as she continued down the path. Once she was sure they were not paying any attention to her, she ducked behind a tree, and waited until they were almost out of sight before following them down the path. Being a gift shop employee, she was not used to the long hike, and after what seemed to her like miles, she began to become nervous as the sun was started to set behind the mountains, and yet the rangers never stopped. Sarah began to question her determination as thoughts of bear and bison attacks began to slip into her mind, since she saw daily reports of visitors having encounters, but she pushed them away and steeled her resolve, and continued her pursuit of the rangers. Hours later she crept along the path as the half moon rose, casting an eerie glow in the darkness as she pursued the rangers. Sarah was starting to become convinced that the rangers were only checking the park after closing 
And just as she started to turn around, she noticed a new light just over the rise. As she slipped from tree to tree, getting closer to her quarry, she began to notice the odor of sulfur and mixed with pine. She finally crested the rise, and saw a cabin with an odd chimney in the center. Anxiety filled her as she debated getting closer to the cabin in order to see what was going on inside, but fear won the day, and she retreated. It took nearly three hours to return, almost getting lost several times along the way. Once she reached the parking lot, she immediately drove home, without stopping, constantly checking her review mirror, worried she might be followed. Thankfully, she never saw anyone follow her, and her fear and anxiety began to subside. Once she reached home, she breathed a sigh of relief and started to think the entire event over in her mind. Sarah wrote how determined she was to still look into what was going on, and decided to use her day off to check out the cabin during the day. Apparently she was so excited and nervous, she slept fitfully, but woke up even more determined to solve the mystery. She wrote that she felt she was living one of those mystery books she loved to read. The next morning Sarah decided to skip her breakfast instead opting for a few protein bars. She also made certain she was dressed appropriately for the long hike to the cabin. After driving to the store parking lot, she decided that it might make the park rangers suspicious if they saw her car in the lot and not working, so she decided to park a bit further up the road, off a small unmarked trail. She then hiked for several hours in the direction of the cabin, making sure she was alone and not seen by any park rangers. She didn't want to blow her chance to find out what was really going on. After almost three hours of hiking, Sarah was about to give up, and panic started to set in, thinking she had gotten herself lost in the miles of forest, when she finally crested a small rise, and found the strange cabin again. The cabin was even more unusual in the day. It was roughly circular with a central chimney that still seemed to exhaust smoke that smelled awful. It was then she realized that it was not smoke but steam, and in flash of understanding, concluded that the cabin was built around a hot spring that wasn't listed on any of the park maps. The facade of the cabin was clearly the original, appearing to have been built at the turn of the century. The rest was definitely upgraded, looking no more than 10 years old. After spending the next hour watching every direction, and closely watching the lodge for any movement, she finally decided to get closer and find out what was going on. Sarah quickly crept up to the building, and looked into several windows just to be certain no one was around. After confirming that she was alone, she circled around to the main entrance. The door was unlocked, which surprised her. If this was park service property, or even USGS, the building should be locked when no one was on site. She almost decided to leave at that moment, but her curiosity got the best of her, and she pressed on. She swiftly opened the door, and quickly closed it behind her, while tiptoeing down the entranceway. There was a room on the right, and on the left before the main doors into the room surrounding the spring. She chose the room on the right first, hoping to find some sort of information relating to the building. Once she opened the door, she was shocked to find neatly folded stacks of clothing with a pair of shoes on top, and the occasional hat, backpack, or purse, many of the piles had a camera as well. It was done so well, and so carefully, as if lovingly prepared. The image was shocking, reminding her of the old horror movies where the killer has a shrine of their victims. Sarah's heart started beating faster, and her breath caught in her throat as she looked around the room. There were dozens of neat stacks, maybe even 50, as she looked closer she noticed that the further down the line, the clothing became more dated, the rows ending in clothes from the turn of the century. It was clear something sinister was going on. Frantically she began to search the clothing for any kind of identification, and yet, every single stack had nothing. Even the cameras had no film, or memory cards. She concluded that any identifying information was deliberately removed. Suddenly a large bang echoed down the hall. Her heart jumped to her throat, as she frantically looked around. Fearing that she might be caught, she bolted down the hall to the doors into the spring room. 
The moment she entered, a wall of oppressive heat overwhelmed her, and she nearly started to cough on the fumes of sulfur. Stifling a cough and a gag, she stumbled around, desperately searching for a place to hide. As she scanned the area, she saw a large path that led to the center of the pool, at the end a large altar. In a stroke of luck, she noticed a large enough space beneath the altar where she could hide. Quickly she wedged herself into the recess and waited. Sarah wrote that she waited for only a few short minutes, before she began to hear voices and footsteps. As sweat began to drip into her eyes, she could hear the pleading of a young girl. I swear I won't ever jump the fence again. Just let me go. I promise, I won't ever break another rule. I don't want to get in trouble. It was only maybe a minute when the pleading suddenly switched to a short shriek and desperate cries. Please no. I won't ever come back, I won't tell anyone, please, please, please. While the girl was begging for what seemed to be her life, Sarah started to notice a calm murmur of many voices. She wrote that she could hear what seemed like a prayer or a chant, but she could not make out any of the words. As she strained to hear what was being said over the girl's sobbing, suddenly the chant stopped and after only a few heartbeats later, a loud blood-curdling scream that was quickly cut off following a splash. Sarah wrote that she was in a near panic attack, she had no idea what was going on, but she thought she had stumbled into a satanic cult murdering people. That thought was quickly extinguished when she felt a deep rumble and then the heat became oppressive. A sudden thought that she would be steamed like a clam flashed through her mind, and then a disgusting odor became far more apparent. This was more than just the smell of sulfur, which she had become used to, it was like a thousand bodies were rotting, and fecal matter mixed with the smell of sulfur. Her stomach roiled and she choked back bile. Out of nowhere, a deafening roar filled the enclosed room, that ended as quickly as it started. Sarah wrote she had no way of knowing if she would be caught, so she fought to remain absolutely silent. Seconds ticked by, and in only a few short minutes, the smell retreated, and the heat began to drop. She could now breath more comfortably, but it still felt like a sauna. It was at that moment, that the group began to chant anew. This was surprisingly brief, and once it was complete, she could hear the footsteps of the cult retreat. Sarah was concerned that if she got up too soon, she would be caught, so she waited for many long minutes. After nearly 30 minutes had passed without a single sound, Sarah slipped out of the crevice and quickly looked around. There was no one around her, and she then instinctively looked into the pool. It was just the same as it was when she arrived. Taking no chances, she quickly gathered her wits, and bolted from the building. Exiting the cabin, the mountain air rapidly cooled the sweat that had drenched her clothing. At this point she was running on autopilot, sprinting her way back out of the woods towards her car, her mind in shock. She was unsure what she just heard, and what the hell she had smelled. Maybe it was actually hell. She reached her car in record time, less than one third of the time it took to reach the cabin. Her body shaking, she jumped into her car, and skidded out of the trail, onto the road, and back in the direction of her home. There is more to come, I will post more from her journal in a couple days. I need to look into this more. Something is going on. I had an encounter, about 1994 in the summer in the Cascades. It was, there were two objects there. I had a 40 pound backpack, I was up by Trout Lake between Big Heart and Little Heart Lake, North Cascades. It was about, I don't know, a 6 or 8 hour hike back there. I never said this publicly. Anyway, I saw these two objects. I thought they were bears because they were down on all fours. I sat down to rest a little bit and I saw these objects. Then all of a sudden I saw them stand up and I thought it was bears standing up on their hind paws. They were, I imagine, 200 feet away. After they had left, they walked away and, as I say, they were six and a half feet tall, something like that. So when I got my courage up, I went over to where they were to see what they were doing and there were some wild strawberries and stuff there. 
They were kind of dark brownish colored. They were not bears. Definitely not bears because I've shot bears before. I was scared out of my pants. Back in 1994, when I was 18, we used to party out at the TNT area all the time, in Point Pleasant. One night we noticed that we were being observed by something that bore a striking resemblance to Mothman. It seemed to be afraid of light. Flashlights, headlights, etc. It would even back off when I took a draw off of my cigarette. At the time I dismissed it because of the amount of alcohol in my system, but I saw it again while I was deployed in Iraq in 2005. I made an observation of a Sasquatch many years ago. It was 2002. I lived in the Portland, Oregon area at that time and I did a lot of wilderness hiking in the Cascades. I decided to go hike to a lake, it was bigger than a pond but smaller than a lake. It was northwest of Mount Adams and southwest of Mount St. Helens. I had a four-wheel drive. It took me about 20 miles of driving to get up there and then a couple miles of hiking. I came in on the southwest corner of this lake. And at the very north end, there was a Sasquatch peeling bark off of a tree. I was frightened at first but then I just got down on my knees at the shoreline and drank some water. It watched me take the drink. Then I sat down and rested for a while. It finished off with the tree bark and then walked away. Then it was time for me to go too. I didn't know if it was going to charge at me, so I left. A co-worker and I were on a business trip around 2007 or 2008 driving on a dark road in South Dakota. I should point out that we weren't allowed to drink on these trips so we were stone sober. I will confess it was late at night and it was a long day. So there is that. It was also a dark rural road lit only by the headlights in front of us. But immediately after what happened and days later, we confirmed we saw the same thing, a man was on the road. All of a sudden. We actually thought we were going to run him over. He sprouted wings and flew up and over the car and out of sight. In 1987 a friend of ours, her name is Sheila, and her brother had gone up above the cascade locks and found some steam vents. And those steam vents, we went up and tried to find them, one weekend of that year and we couldn't find them. So what we did was we went back and talked to Sheila and she gave us a map. We went back up there with that map and it was a long way up there and we found them. While we were there, we found those vents and I thought to myself, I wonder how much pressure there is, so I picked up a rock to throw it into the hole to see if it would pop back out, and when I picked that rock up this tall Bigfoot suddenly appeared. Now let me explain how it looked. It snarled, it was nasty. It stepped over a log that I would have had to crawl over and it stood there and growled at us. I had that rock in my hand and I was getting ready to throw it and I froze. My friend was standing there off to the left of me looking over and that thing snarled at us. It had eyes like a cherry on your cigarette. When I was a kid I had heard stories about this. While we were standing there, my buddy's friend took off running and it turned its body and followed him but when he got too far, he turned himself to me and looked me in the eye and I'm not kidding, I got the biggest rush I've ever had in my life. I remembered that the native people used to say, that if you see one and you look him in the eyes, he will steal your soul. It scared the crap out of me. I swear back in 2010 I saw the Mothman. It was dark but I'll never forget the massive red eyes staring at me through the woods. I was in a vehicle with my two buddies on a dirt trail. It was in Truro, Nova Scotia, Canada. It wasn't the only time things happened in those woods but that was definitely the craziest time. One moonlit night in winter at 7.20 pm, a practical, and down-to-earth retired solicitor's clerk, 
Miss Bertha Humphreys of North Walsham in Norfolk, stumbled upon the inexplicable. She recalls, it had been snowing heavily, and when I took my little dog for his evening walk, the ground was thickly carpeted with snow, so I decided to go for a short walk down one side of the road and up the other. Sooty was on a lead, and at the bottom of the Mundesley Road, where she resides, near Crow's Lane, they crossed and returned on the other side, walking slowly because it was slippery underfoot. She recounts, I glanced ahead and at the top of the road where it swerves at the bend, I saw a dull, red glow moving above the ground from side to side. At first I thought it was the rear lights of a car reversing. Then the glowing still persisted moving, I thought possibly it was snow spots I was seeing, just as one sees sunspots. I rubbed my eyes, we walked on. Then I stopped and stared, as the object had now emerged from the narrow part of the road and was floundering along. It was a jet black oblong shape, dark and bat-like, and in the center was a circle of dull red light. I stood still, mystified when the next thing I knew it was coming towards me slowly and taking up the complete crown of the road. When it reached the wider section of the road, near the orchard garden's public house, it floundered and fluttered and slowly rose into the air across the open space until it reached the housetop level, the red circle still glowing and the black shape flapping and billowing like a cloak. Then I observed it was dragging behind, as it were the tail of a kite, a miniature of itself, black, oblong, with a glowing red circle in the center. It stayed for a second or two at rooftop level, then with renewed effort shot up to a much higher level, floating again. Then it shot up higher still and disappeared in the clouds. All this was in complete silence as the object made no noise whatsoever, although it struggled hard to get airborne. It would seem that the object got caught in the narrow section of the road, as the red glowing was drifting from side to side. It was not until it came floundering to the wider part that I could see its shape, which took the form of an oblong sail and it floated towards me. After it became airborne and had disappeared from sight, a gentleman came along. I asked him if he had seen an unusual object in the sky. He unfortunately had been gazing down watching his step, as it was very dangerous walking. He had seen nothing and suggested that the object might be something sent out from the radar station to warn ships. Needless to say, I did not tell how the object became airborne, and that it had previously been floundering along the Mundesley Road. She told no one of her uncanny experiences as she was sure that nobody would believe her, but stressed it was perfectly true. She later wrote to the Astronomer Royal about the incident, but no response was forthcoming. I had a few encounters with Sasquatch, a whole family of them as a matter of fact. A friend and I found ourselves smack dab in the middle of Sasquatch country in north central Washington. We went 45 miles to the end of the road and we hiked 6 miles up in and around, then we hiked the 2000 feet elevation gain. By the time we got there, it was totally dark. I shined my light ahead of him and I saw these red eyes right in front of him like in the back. I said, stop. Don't go that way. And it was right on the end of a cliffside. We almost got to where we were supposed to camp and we went around the other way a couple hundred yards. When we got to where we were going and set up camp in the middle of this clear cut because an avalanche or a snow slide came through and took everything out. And right over there in that exact spot where I had just grabbed him, all of a sudden we heard a 300 pound boulder just, like, crashing through the brush and it was like a totally flat spot and that's when it started. They pretty much left us alone all night. The next morning we started hearing the rock knockers around us, up on the cliff. We started hearing what sounded like 300 pound giant woodpeckers and I figured it was them, they were making this noise with their throats but really loud. And they were moving around a lot, in the woods, but we couldn't see anything. Then we heard him, the screaming howler, the big daddy, coming up the valley, letting out this roar every minute for half an hour straight. He would scream for 30 seconds. He sounded like the Westmoreland Pia Howler if you ever heard that. We hiked out of there and they let us go.
My father swears to have seen the Mothman. He lived in downtown Los Angeles, circa 1970, and was walking through a neighborhood with a friend around 11 p.m. Suddenly, they noticed a very tall or lanky and limber, black short furred but naked man with bright red laser shine eyes and wings that looked like a moth's but translucent. They claim it was basically parkouring a few home roofs at a time. The wings seemed to shortly glide it, more than flap or propel it. It was a dead quiet night, yet there were no sounds of landing contact. It glanced at them briefly and continued until it leapt over a small building and kept going. My dad's friend immediately committed to and became a pastor. My dad was a very talented man who sought the most out of life. That sighting made them rethink the value of their lives. This is about to be a long post so, apologies ahead of time. I never believed in cryptids at all until I saw one myself. I didn't know that there was a Mothman then, but what I saw was eerily similar. It was in late December of 2005, easy to remember because I'd gotten LASIK, surgery, on both my eyes and I had better than 20-20 vision at the time. I was living in an apartment complex that had a communal laundry in the center. It was a bit after sunset and I happened to look up at the roof of my building, and that's when I saw it. At first, I thought it was a person, crouched on the roof, resting their head and arm on one knee. Except, it was grey, incredibly muscular, and looked like a gargoyle to me. We locked eyes, it made a large huff sound, like a bull, and it galloped across the roof line, the sound was like a horse, and then it leapt and the biggest wings I've ever seen came out of it, with an unforgettable whoosh. These things exist. I wish there were a way to show my memory of it to people. I have literally never heard of BEKs before that night in May 2023. After taking my girl out for a night where she had a bit too much to drink, after holding her hair. She doesn't usually let loose like that, we know alcohol can lower our vibrations. Anyway, I was hopped up on caffeine from being the designated driver. So after I tucked her in, I went for a drive. Not two blocks from my house, in Henrico County, Virginia, I saw a little kid, maybe 10, a boy, on the side of the road in a black hoodie. He waved and I slowed down to see if he was okay. Before I rolled my window down, I had a bad feeling of dread. The kid looked up and had pale skin, empty eyes, black eyes, just so black and void. I didn't stick around. I sped off and came home. I was freaked out. Then my dog started growling. He started looking at the door. I didn't look out but I felt an unexplainable dread so I prayed the Lord's Prayer and then my dog stopped growling. Then I googled kids with black eyes and went down this rabbit hole. The sighting happened at 1.10 am approximately in the lakeside area of Henrico, Virginia, near Richmond. I am so freaked out that I haven't slept well after the incident. Also, the kid grinned but something about the grin was off. Didn't speak to him. I think it was spring or summer so my aunt was out late. She was only around 15 so my Nona would wait up until 11 or 12 for her. This night she went to bed early but left a note to tell my aunt I was asleep on the couch so be quiet. My Nona would always leave the microwave light on for me, I had and still have shadows, windows at night, and the dark. After around 4 hours of sleep I woke up feeling strange, like my presence was known. I took a minute for my eyes to adjust but standing at the bottom of the stairs was a person. It was not my aunt because she is African American and the figure was white, like glowing. It also appeared to be male and I could make out some features like glasses and suspenders. It looked like he was about to walk up the stairs when turned and stared at me. After a minute I closed my eyes and went back to sleep. When I told my Nona she said it was my grandfather but in all my years he has never been upstairs but twice.
My cousin and her husband just had their first baby and were going out to eat for the first time with her. Their baby girl was having a great time, looking at everything, giggling, etc. An older woman came up to them and commented that their baby was adorable and had big, beautiful eyes. As soon as she walked away, the baby started crying, like someone is squeezing the life out of her type crying. They took her home and she kept crying. And screaming. For 24 hours straight. They next day my family and my aunt, cousin's mom, went over because of what was happening. My aunt took one look at the baby and said the lady from the restaurant gave them the evil eye. She proceeded to take two dried chilies from the cupboard. Lighting the gas stove, she placed one chili in the flame and let it burn, the gray smoke drawn up by the vent, as expected. She then took the second chili and passed it over the crying baby while praying. She then put this second chili in the flame and, I am not exaggerating here, the chili burned to ash so quickly and the smoke was green. Their baby immediately stopped crying. I have never seen anything like this ever. One night I was alone with my mother in our home. She was doing the dishes when I went outside to put the garbages in the bin. On my way back, I was thinking about various things and something came to my mind that I wanted to tell her, I don't remember what but it's not important for the story. So I just keep that in mind to avoid to forget it. I can't explain the layout of the house but basically when I got back into the house, I saw my mother going upstairs. She used the stairs at the end of the corridor. The light was tuned off but I saw her silhouette and I heard the wooden stairs crackling as all wooden stairs do. So I said to myself I need to remember what I have to say when she comes back basically. So I go back in the kitchen which is just behind the door next to me. When I enter the kitchen I jump scared. My mother was here. I just took few seconds to process the situation. It was impossible for her to come back in twos. I went to take the biggest knife we had and told my mother to stay downstairs and to be ready to call the cops because someone was upstairs. Yes, I went upstairs with a knife. Not the most clever decision. So I went upstairs, I took my biggest voice, which is not scary at all, and asked the person to show up and I would let it go. No answer. I am going in all the rooms, one by one, I am looking under every beds, into every wardrobes. Nobody. I check all the windows, all closed. Nobody was upstairs and nobody could escape through a window. I never find out who or what I saw. Now I have to say that a lot of weird things happened in this house. Shutters closed by themselves. Weird things happening with the electricity. Plenty of things I can't remember everything. Probably 10 years after this event, my mother saw her grandmother at night, she died when I was really young. She woke up and she was there. They discussed for hours. My mother learned things she did not know and she could verify few days later. She could not have known this things by herself before. She did not told me those things. I also have to say my mother did not believe in supernatural before. I think she does now and I like to think I saw her grandmother that night and she was wandering in the house until she could tell her those things. When I was about 5 years old or so, I was laying awake at night on my crib in my parents bedroom. I specifically remember the door being closed in the room so my siblings couldn't have done what was about to happen. And I'm laying there I'm thinking about a million things and suddenly this great force pushes the bottom of my bed and I am propelled a few inches off my bunk. It had about three times consecutively. My best way of describing it is if someone stuck their palm out and pushed from underneath the bed. I immediately covered myself w the blankets, beyond scared. I didn't wake up my parents or cry, for reasons that I have always been curious about. I look at the doorway for a few moments trying to rationalize the moment, hoping it was one of my siblings. The door never opened. I someone fell asleep and the next day when I brushed my teeth I looked underneath my bed and all there was were some of my shoes and toys. To this day I will always remember the experience vividly and I'm always curious what was that aggressive force.
Couple of things but they were explained eventually. 1. In high school my bedroom was in the basement and I was home alone and my bedroom was shut but it slammed as if someone hit the door from the outside and it freaked me the f out I walked around the house looking for someone and then I just left until my parents came back. Happened a few more times and then I eventually realized something jammed the hinge. So the door would shut but it wouldn't be shut all the way and eventually it would pop into place very forcefully. 2. I wake up in the middle of the night to my mom yelling down the stairs asking if I was okay and I was confused as hell but she said someone was yelling and it woke her up. This happened a few times and she kept assuming it was me. Then one night I'm awake super late as it normally happens around 3 am. And I hear it too and it's blood curdling as if someone is being murdered and it's pretty damn loud but you can't really tell where it's coming from. We hear it a couple more times and although we never for sure found out we are pretty certain the old guy next door was having night terrors. He was pretty quiet but every now and then he would show some signs that he was a bit disturbed and angry, I'm assuming he has PTSD or something. My family was staying over at my uncle's place. I had been looking forward to going because I love his cat, Guy, but he told us that Guy had died about a week before we came up. He was an old cat so I wasn't surprised, just disappointed. The first night I sleep on the couch and I'm having a hard time falling asleep in a strange house. I'm facing the back of the couch. Eyes open just kind of zoning out when a car driving by casts light that slides across the whole room. When the light runs up the wall behind the couch, I feel the light tap of a small animal jumping on the couch around my feet. I've owned cats all my life, so it's very distinctive to me. I don't move. Light footsteps move up the edge of the couch until I feel something round and soft flop into the crook of my knees. It begins to warm that spot and I feel drowsy almost immediately. I told my family, but the only one who believed me was my uncle he said the guy always slept in the crook of his knees. Not super creepy but just really odd and to this day unexplained. When I was in high school I had a habit of staying up really late, usually just dicking around on the internet playing games, editing photos, or video chatting with people in other states. I lived in a pretty dense suburb with a lot of light pollution that had a distinct orange hue. That orange glow is a distinct part of my nighttime memories of staying up late, sitting on my rooftop, or sneaking out with friends. One night, around 3 am, I get a chill and something just feels off. It took me a while to figure out what it was until I noticed the stream of light coming in between my curtains is green. Then I realize everything around me has taken on this green hue, like someone put a filter over my vision. I open the window and it's the same outside. It doesn't seem like the lights have visibly changed color but everything is green, even the ambient glow of the light refracted through the hazy, humid air. Convinced I'm losing my mind I woke up my little sister to ask her if everything is green. She's confused for a moment, and does in fact think I'm nuts, but after she wakes up a bit and adjusts confirms that everything is in fact green. We sat up together for a while, looking around and trying to come up with an explanation, and over the course of about 30 minutes the green slowly faded away back to the familiar orange glow. Never figured out what happened and every now and then I still wonder about it. So with me the most recent one was when I went to take a bath. We have one of those old bathtubs that are raised off the ground. I was standing on a towel turning on the bath when all of the sudden the towel I'm standing on gets pulled underneath the bathtub. At first I laughed it off because I thought it was one of my cats playing with me, but when I tried pulling the towel out from underneath the bathtub with my foot it wouldn't come out from under. Eventually after a minute or two I finally got it out, but there was a hand print from where the towel was pulled under and it was larger than my hand print. I also ended up looking underneath the bathtub and nothing was there. With my mom she was in the kitchen doing something I don't remember what, 
But she heard a male child laughing behind her when she turned around there was a smaller black shadow standing in the doorway. Then it said hi to her and disappeared. Another time she was sitting at the computer when she was home alone and all of the sudden she had pebbles being tossed at her. Just before my 10th birthday, I dreamed that I killed my grandfather by stabbing him in the heart. He died of a massive heart attack within a week of that dream, on my birthday. When I was in high school, I dreamed an acquaintance of mine died in a car accident. Two days later, she tried to beat an 18-wheeler onto the freeway and didn't make it. Killed two other young ones from our school with her. When I was in college, I dreamed that two people I didn't know were hit by a car while jogging. An old man ran down two members of the track team while they were out jogging a day or two later. I didn't know them, but I heard details about it from a friend of mine who was on the track team and knew them well. I don't keep a dream journal anymore. I worked at an assisted living or nursing home for a few years. When I was first hired, my co-workers told me the place was haunted, but I just brushed it off because every nursing home I have worked at, I was told was haunted. A lot of creepy stuff did happen at that place, though, but I'll just tell the creepiest one. I worked the third shift, from 9 p.m. to 7 a.m. My job was to distribute nighttime medicine, clean, check the doors to make sure they were locked, and walk around with a walkie-talkie to check in on old people if needed. Mostly, I would sit in this big chair and draw. One night, chores were finished, I was doodling in my favorite chair, and down the hall to my left was Mrs. Wilson's door. She was a funny lady, cranky as hell, and a bit of a hoarder but super cool. So, I'm sitting in the chair, and I hear knocking on her door. I look over, and no one is there. Mobility-wise, there is no way it's her knocking on her own door. I start putting my drawing stuff away so I can check on her anyway, and I hear knocking again, but this time it's very aggressive. I drop my stuff and walkie-talkie to the janitor that she is knocking on her door like crazy, and I may need help. As I approach her door, I hear her yelling. God damn it. Just come in. It's unlocked. I open the door, and she is in her recliner where she preferred to sleep. I ask if she was knocking, and she snaps back at me. Me knocking? It's you knocking on my damn door every damn night. I'm sick of it. I just told her I was sorry and would leave her alone. She said she would get me fired if I didn't stop messing with her. I talked to my manager in the morning, and he assured me my job was secure and told me everyone who has lived in that room complains about someone knocking on the door at night. Freaked me out. Another time, I heard an old man's voice ask me, what are you drawing, little lady? I answered as I looked up because it was not unusual for the residents to be up and walking around at all hours, but no one was there. I got up and looked everywhere. No one was there. The janitor and I spent a lot of break smoking and telling our stories. Here's a little backstory before I get into it. I'm 19 years old, my grandparents on my mother's side passed away a few years before I was born. My grandmother passed away in the dining room, which back then was her bedroom since she was severely ill after her stroke. My bedroom at the time was right above on the second floor. Up until a few years ago I never knew what she looked like but only knew of stories. Here's where it gets interesting. I was maybe 5, or 6 years old, and my father worked third shift, and my mom was yet to come home from work. My neighbor attached to us had come over and she put my sister and I to bed. My sister is 3 years older than me, it was late that night when I woke up and my bedroom door was open and I saw an older woman standing in the doorway. She had white hair and pink curlers, and a nightgown on. And she was just standing there. I don't remember feeling any sort of fear, or being uncomfortable. But I wasn't confused as well. Keep in mind, I'm still to this day afraid of the dark at times. I always fear somebody is watching me, so having this thing in the doorway would have been terrifying to me. 
jump forward almost 11 years, keeping that to myself, I'm with my mom and my sister going through photos we had found and photos from my aunt. There's one of my grandmother sitting at the kitchen table using an old phone, with a cigarette in her hands, her hair in curlers, and a pink nightgown on. The outfit she was wearing when she passed away a couple years later. I believe in paranormal, I believe that ghosts exist, and I believe I saw my grandmother that night. My mother never wore her hair in curlers. So I have a few stories. I'll preface by saying I've always thought my entire neighborhood is haunted, and still do. When I suggested this as a kid, literally no one believed me, but recently other people have had encounters. As a child, I would see three white semi-transparent figures cross past my bedroom door every night. One tall, thin guy, one average heighted guy with an average build, and one short, bigger guy. I also recall seeing a figure climbing the stairs when I was a child. The figure was wearing dark clothes, purple, maybe black. My backyard is very large, with a thin tree line that opens up to a small field with power lines running through it, leading to a forest with a highway. As soon as it gets dark, beyond the first thin tree line, you get the most intense feeling that you're being watched, and your presence is unwanted. This has been felt or discussed by all my friends. Some suggest that there is a Native American presence back there, possibly native land. It's sometimes alluring, and in one particular incident, my friends and I felt like we were in a vortex of sorts. We were in the woods, laughing and being loud, and there seemed to be so much energy building up between the three of us. We were completely unaware of what was happening around us. Suddenly, it seemed like all the energy was sucked out of the air, we instantly became aware of our surroundings, and we all got an eerie, creepy feeling. Needless to say, we left the woods. One morning when I was a child, my brother and I were eating breakfast with my dad in the kitchen, and all of a sudden, we hear music going full blast in reverse coming from the basement. Someone, or something, had turned on my dad's music equipment in the basement, playing my brother's CD at full volume in reverse. There's no way it could have gone on by itself. There is a presence I refer to as the old man, and whenever I talk about him on or around our property, I get goosebumps, my eyes water, I shiver, and feel his aggressive presence. He hates to be talked about and lingers in the dark. I don't know much about all this as I cut myself off from my curiosity in communicating or opening myself up to the other side after a complicated or intense experience as a teenager, which frightened me, but I am fully convinced of his presence. It would terrify me to be alone in the house growing up, and I felt him the most in the basement. Our toy room was in the basement growing up, more of a closet than anything. Numerous times, I found myself playing in the toy room and sensed someone coming down the stairs and entering the basement. I was always so sure it was my brother coming to scare me, and I'd call out to him trying to talk, and every time when I got no answer, I'd peek out to find no one in the basement. There was always that eerie feeling of being watched in my basement. When my brother was in college, he drove home for the night to hang out and planned on driving back to school in the morning. He woke up late and couldn't find his wallet anywhere. He looked all over his room, all over the house, it was gone. So he left without it. When I got home from my classes, my dad was about to exit my brother's room after looking for my brother's wallet around his bed, on his bedside table, all the normal places. I entered the room, and he followed after me telling me he already looked everywhere. I kid you not, I round the corner of his bed, and his wallet is sitting in the middle of his floor next to the bed. My dad said that made no sense as he literally just got down on the floor where it was to look under his bed for it. Neighbors. So finally, my family is starting to believe me around the time they obtained this information. At a little neighborhood gathering, my parents were talking to neighbors two houses down, and they said they hear footsteps in their house constantly, and they found old strange things in their yard. My next door neighbor told me recently, as we discussed the paranormal, that her younger brother had woken up in the middle of the night, fully awake, 
and saw a woman's figure standing in his room. She added to this, saying she definitely believed there was some kind of presence in our neighborhood. There are more smaller incidents and some others, one in particular, that I don't discuss, and I'm sure I'm forgetting others, but here are the ones that stick out. Also, I used to mess around with this Ouija board, I know, so stupid, and nothing ever really happened. We did it officially too, three candles, three people, incense. I used to keep it propped up on the window above my bed when not in use, and it would fall on me while I slept, but I never really thought anything of it. One time I tried to cleanse my room with the herb sage, and after I did, I put the sage out, as witnessed by a friend, there was no smoke. We left, and I get a call a while later, and my room was literally on fire. The fan in my room had reignited the sage, that was witnessed to be completely out by me and a friend. The Ouija board survived though, I managed to salvage a lot, but I always had a creeping feeling that it was retaliation for trying to cleanse the room. Now it just hangs on my wall. I sometimes joke about using it, but I don't know if I ever would again. Story time. Hiking the Appalachian Trail one summer. In Vermont, I come up to an old white fire tower which is on the trail as a night camp. It's about 11.30, and my headlamp goes out almost when I get to the building. I step in and it looks like a museum. Wool blankets, food on an old tin plate, kerosene lantern and Osborne fire finder. Straight out of a 1920s photograph. Right down to the old forest service pack in the corner. Obviously someone was here because there was food on the plate, so I grab the bunk and go to sleep. Get up at 7 am and everything is gone. I'm laying on the floor in a completely empty boarded up fire tower. No nothing inside but a note that said, thanks for spending the time, it's been a while. A story from a group I encountered while hiking. When I was in Boy Scouts, we went on a canoe trip into the deep woods and lakes on the Minnesota or Canada border. On our last day, we got stuck on a trail and couldn't go in the water due to lightning. We ran into a couple of groups and started talking about some stories. This is where we heard the following tale. The group we met had encountered a guy a couple of nights back. He walked out of the woods with no shoes on. This isn't the kind of place you can just stroll through. If you aren't prepared, you're dead. He asked if he could join them by the fire, claiming he had gotten lost the night before. He also inquired about any extra food. Since one of their group members had gotten hurt on the way up, they gave him some food, and after about an hour, he was on his way. They did offer to call on their satellite phone to the main base to help get this guy back, but he declined and seemed agitated by the offer. The next day, they saw a small plane overhead. The only planes in this area are for medical emergencies, so they thought someone nearby needed it. They found out as the plane landed nearby and came close to them that it was a police plane. They were asked if the group had met anyone recently and given a short description, which, as you guessed, matched the guy they had encountered the night before. He was apparently an escaped convict and had committed three murders. After that, they had someone keep watch each night in case the guy ever came back. Luckily, he didn't, but those guys didn't get much sleep. Just after sunrise, my wife and I were laying in our tent, talking. The tent was situated in a clearing next to the Wilson River, right along the edge of the tree line. We were the only people camping in this clearing, and it was very remote from other camping areas, which is why we chose it. Off in the distance at an angle behind the tent and deep in the forest, we heard what sounded like someone breaking large sticks or small logs against the trunk of a tree. We found this odd because there were no trails or roads where we heard this. Why would anyone be out there? Also, we were the only ones around to the best of our knowledge, as this was not close to any campgrounds. The early hour also added to the strangeness of the sounds we heard. After maybe a couple of minutes of hearing this, 
The sounds became more intense and changed to what sounded more like very large branches being snapped and small trees actually being uprooted and pushed over. The sound slowly moved towards us at this point. I thought there must be someone driving some kind of machinery through the forest and plowing over anything standing in the way, perhaps a cat being used to forge new access for a logging operation. As it got to within maybe 150 feet of our tent, I realized there was no engine sound. It kept coming closer. When it got to within what sounded like 50 feet or so, the sound of trees being uprooted and broken stopped and was replaced with the sound of very heavy and slow footsteps, still coming closer to the tent. The sound continued approaching until it was within maybe 3 or 4 feet behind the tent, then it stopped as if examining our tent or just waiting. Unfortunately, the tent had no windows to look out, so we just laid there, being as silent as possible while I clutched my hatchet and held my breath. I can't be positive because we were both very frightened by this point, but I thought I could hear what sounded like something huge breathing just a couple of feet off the back of our tent. This may have been my imagination, though. My wife said she didn't hear breathing. After a pause of 15 to 20 seconds, the footsteps began to angle off into the forest again. When the footsteps seemed to be 15 or 20 feet away, I quietly got up and crawled out of the tent to see what had made this racket. I walked around the back of the tent, still clutching my hatchet, and peered into the forest. It was too dense to see very far, so I started to venture into the woods towards the direction of the footsteps which I could still hear fading off in the distance. I followed for 20 or 30 feet and could see nothing. That's when the fear got the best of me, and I scrambled back to the tent. We remained in the tent for at least another hour before venturing out. I kept peering into the forest but didn't see or hear anything again. By now, friends who we were expecting began to show up, so we felt a bit safer. When my curiosity finally got the best of me, I ventured into the forest towards the direction of the crashing and snapping sounds we had heard coming towards us. No one would come with me. After going for 50 or more feet in that direction, I came upon a huge tangle of fallen old growth logs with a very dense stand of smaller trees and dense underbrush on the other side where the sound had originated. Several smaller trees had been snapped off or pushed over. No machine could ever have crossed over the fallen logs, as they were several feet in diameter. And I know of no machine that makes footsteps. Then fear took hold again, and I ran to the safety of the clearing without looking for footprints. I never went back into the forest the entire weekend after that. We could only explain what we heard as being a Sasquatch. The only problem I had with this theory was that I have always thought if these creatures existed, they would be very silent and reclusive, avoiding humans whenever possible. Certainly not crashing through the forest like a bulldozer. These sounds were intentional. I can't say for certain what we heard, but I do know without any doubt that it was not a human, machinery, a bear, an elk, or anything else that might be commonly found in these forests. I've spent much of the last 20 years trying to come up with an explanation for what we heard. I have none other than a Sasquatch. Why it made such a racket is beyond me. I live in South Africa which is a very dangerous country with lots of crime. Keep this in mind. I'm 18 now but when I was 14 and still at school, I was part of the land club at my school where once on a Friday night every couple of months we would all get together with our computers at school, set them up in a classroom, hook them up to a central modem and play video games together all night. The school I went to was massive and had wide open areas with grass and trees and stuff. Some parts were literally small forests. It's almost like a huge park with buildings scattered throughout it and lots of roads. So one night at Land Club, my friends and I decided to go out for a walk around the school at around 1 am. There were about 6 of us and we were just walking around until we heard the sound of a car driving around. We found this extremely weird and walked up a little hill until we saw this car driving around in the distance. It was in the middle of the night but it had no lights on. 
I had one of those stargazing lasers on me and my dumbass decided to shine it at the windshield of the car. As soon as I did it, the car screeched to a stop. Then it started driving again, in our direction. That's when we decided to try hide where we were and we kinda thought of it as a game. We were on the edge of a tiny forest and a large open field. We split up into groups of two and had two in the forest, two on the edge, me and a mate, and two on the field. All of us were lying down flat on the ground. There was a road about 10 meters in front of us. The car drove right in front of my friend and I and suddenly turned its car so that it was facing us. Then the lights just turned on, blinding us. I couldn't see anything but out of nowhere from the light I see this dark figure of a man running towards us getting bigger. That's when we bolted. This man had the jump on us so he was super close behind us when we started running. My friend and I split up as we ran and he carried on chasing me. I was shitting myself. Keep in mind this man has not said a single word yet and almost all teachers would at least say something. Now that I think back on it, this part was quite funny. After a while of running I turned my head to look back to see how far he was behind me and I did so at the exact right moment because as I did that he literally face planted and I'll never forget seeing his face drag across the grass. Anyways we kept running, past the land classroom, all the way to the other side of the school. We thought we were safe to hide somewhere there until we heard the sound his car again. We started running again until we were far from the roads and watched from afar. This car was slowly driving around literally looking for us and even drove as far as the other side of the school. It gives me the chills thinking of what he would have done if he had caught us. To people that think it was probably one of our teachers. His body shape and head shape, he was also bald, didn't look anything like our teachers. He clearly saw our faces when he turned the headlights and shone it on our faces and would have said something on Monday. But no teacher said anything and we weren't called up. Why would he say nothing? Surely they would say, hey kids what are you doing? Why would they be at school at 1am? Creepy stuff. During high school, aged 14 or so me and my mates used to go camping about a mile from the closest road. One night me and two friends, Simon and Stuart, were waiting for our friend, Nick, to join us after his date with a girl. It was getting dark and we were sat in the tent with the door open as it was raining. I was getting paranoid and kept thinking I could see a white figure behind a tree closest to the tent. My friends could see it too but they just blamed it on the pot and the darkness playing with our eyes. I zipped up the tent after a while as it was freaking me out. The area was heavily wooded and every now and then I would hear footsteps crunching on the leaves all around the tent. I kept telling them to shut up and listen, but it would always go quiet just after. After about an hour or so forgetting all about it, we all heard the most terrifying sound, a shing like something sharp or blunt being scraped against something nearby. We all looked at each other and held breath, shitting ourselves. When sound happened a second time we all started putting on our shoes in a panic and ran out of the tent in the direction of my friend's house about a mile away. We ran in the dark and rained through a field and then the woods until we met the road and walked to my friend's house all scared and shaking. Shortly after we got in Nick rings us asking where the hell we are saying he's at the campsite. We shouted down the phone to get the hell out of there and described what we heard. He told us to stop joking around asking where we are. When he got back he said he walked all around the campsite and the fields to try and find us as he still thinks we're joking, walking through the woods he heard the footsteps of a person. He called out, thinking it was us, when he was met with no reply, he quickly ran back. We all went back in the morning and nothing was taken or moved. 14 years later I still have no idea what that was. Went walking with a female friend really late at night and turned down a closed dirt road that I knew had washed out a few miles down. I didn't think we would see anyone and after a couple of miles down the road we heard a motor start and come roaring up the road. I reacted and got my friend and I off the road just as the lights came over a hill and hit us. 
This pickup full of guys stops about 100 feet away from where we were hiding in the woods. Guys starts yelling for us to come out and after a minute or two they start getting angry and start hoping out the truck with flashlights and start looking around. Luckily I knew the woods and area really well and have a pretty good sense of direction so I take my friend and creep further down the road until we are well out of earshot and cross the road and after we hear the truck start up and roar off we start heading back up staying well into the woods and before long we see this truck slowly creeping along with its lights off. They kept doing this and every time they pass we got low and behind something so it takes us almost 2 hours to get back out to the main road. I kept us off the sidewalk just in case until we got back to the house because I did not want to find out what those guys might do. I was walking down a quiet country lane late night, it was January and it was snowing, it would have been quite scenic but there was something wrong about the atmosphere. The road was uncannily quiet, and I felt a bit edgy because I was far out from anywhere. There was a bus stop, the twice a week kind of bus you get in places like this, with a wooden bench. There was somebody sitting there, seemingly wrapped up in a big jacket with the hood up. I didn't have any option, I had to walk past. You have to understand, this is like 2 and there was no bus coming. They didn't move as I came past and I hurried off. I was just really freaked out. When I reflect on it I think I probably did the wrong thing. They might have needed help, but that's how the goddamn aliens get you. While scanning the valley floor, for sheep, a mile from my house, I noticed two loping figures. Initially, I thought the figures were coyotes or stray dogs, but as the two figures neared an old sunken vehicle, I realized that the things were about the size of the vehicle. Nearly 8 feet long. No animal could be that big on the res. I watched the two figures until they disappeared into the woods, across the valley. It was starting to get dark, but the moon was bright enough, so I walked without a light. As I walked down the mountain, I heard something yelling. It was like a howl or a yell. I started to hurry. Then, when I got to my house, I locked the door and spent the night listening to the strangest sounds. I'm sure it was a skinwalker, but I found this sight and was surprised. I was gaming at my friend's place at night and afterwards I decided to walk through a park that cut my walk time back to my place in half. The park was quite large but it had street lamps on the main path. Once I started down the path I saw a woman crying. I thought that it was sad. She was probably having a bad night. But when I passed her on the path I saw it wasn't a lady at all, it was a guy in drag who looked at me and gave me the creepiest predatory smile I've ever seen. I thought well that's disturbing I kept walking and got to a bridge on a little hill. I looked back and the dude was following me. He was still below the hill and after I walked onto the bridge and couldn't see him I booked it to the other end. At that point I dived into the bushes and looked out at the path. Sure enough there came the creep, running. He stopped at the end of the bridge and looked around, probably wondering where I'd gone, and then he walked off. I waited a while until I was sure the coast was clear and went home. That guy was definitely messed up and definitely following me in a park at night. Hate to think what his intentions were. Eight years ago, my brother John was heading home from his girlfriend's house off a county road outside of Boulder, 11 miles south of Pinedale, Wyoming. It was around 1 or 2 am when he saw what he described as a huge dog traversing down the slope on the south side of the road, commencing to run alongside his pickup. He was driving a 1969 to 1974 F-150 high boy, which came from the factory lifted. The dogman was running with him at 35 to 40 miles per hour. There's a 2 to 3 feet barrow ditch running along the road, and the dogman's head was level with his as he was driving, so John estimated its height at 7 to 8 feet. It was dark in color with gray or white on its muzzle running from its nose to under its eyes, which were amber in color. 
He sped up to 45 miles per hour, and the dogman kept up with him, often looking inside the pickup. He set at around 50 miles per hour, he lost it, and that's all he would tell me. Not necessarily a hiking story but as few years ago before I moved away to university I used to enjoy going for long walks down to my local beach late at night. This one time it was about 11.30 pm and next to the beach there is an outcrop of land with an old communications tower on it from World War II. This outcrop is usually where teenagers go to drink during the summer and where I go to be alone during the quieter months, but as this was a very cold in November I wasn't expecting to see anyone there at all. I got to the top of the hill before the outcrop and in the moonlight I saw what looked like three people sat by the communications tower. I paused my music to try and hear them to confirm it was actually a group of people. Since it's really really dark out there sometimes it's hard to distinguish shadows and shapes from actual people. I couldn't hear anything so I kept walking in their direction for a bit longer until I could see more clearly. It was actually three people, but it appeared to be two older men and a young child. I was very confused so I called out to them and then that's when they noticed me. Without saying anything they all got up walked towards me and then turned off to the forest path that went back into town before they got to where I was standing. I'm still very confused what two grown men and a small boy were doing out in such a remote place so late at night but there has never been any news to indicate it was something suspicious, just a standard creepy occurrence in a small coastal town. This isn't really my story but I happen to know it. This happened in my town. So there was this guy who was walking his dogs during New Year's night. He got shot in the back of his head. My dad was one of the people who worked on the case. Turns out he was shot by a cartel. Or at least by somebody that got instructions from a cartel. They were looking for someone and the description they used to find him was that their target walked his dogs at night on the same spot as this guy but they'd shot the wrong guy. The actual target was later arrested by what would be a SWAT team in America. My dad said the actual guy had turned his home into a bunker because after the accident he knew it was for him. In the spring of 1979, I, went hunting on Rice Road, south of Cochrane Road, west of Timber, Oregon, T3 and R5W. I stumbled upon a soft spot near the creek where I discovered a massive track, measuring 18 to 20 inches in length and sunk 4 inches into the sediment. Interestingly, there were no other tracks around. Excitedly, I shared my discovery with a friend, mentioning that he, too, had seen a track nearby, situated between Highway 26 and Timber. As we moved further towards the coast, Another friend named Larry S. had a remarkable encounter. At Elderberry, he witnessed a Bigfoot right in the middle of the road. In the mid-1980s I would spend a lot of time with my grandparents who had a cabin overlooking Lake James in the mountains of North Carolina. I would help out around the cabin, mowing grass, chopping wood, and helping in the garden. It's about a 300-yard walk through the woods to the lake. Grandma liked catfish so I'd spend evenings and sometimes all night catching catfish. There were no houses within a couple miles of my grandparents' cabin. Several times I had the feeling I was not alone, like I was being watched. The first odd thing was I had walked up the bank, maybe 30 yards, to throw a bass plug across a point where I'd heard a fish chasing bait. When I came back my stringer with three nice catfish was gone. At first, I thought maybe I didn't get it firmly in the ground. But while shining my flashlight around I found footprints. I was a good size 16 year old and wore a size 13 shoes. Those barefoot tracks were just a little bit bigger. On my way back up the trail to the cabin I found my stringer hanging in a tree over the trail. I didn't say anything to my grandparents. I just said that the fish weren't biting. Two nights later I was back in my spot. I had a couple nice ones on the stringer when the feeling of not being alone hit me like a ton of bricks. 
For some reason, I wasn't scared. I shined my flashlight around. I didn't see anything but I heard something walking in the woods. I had a small fire going and it was lighting up the clearing. As I was getting back to fishing a small rock hit the water right where the stringer was. In my head, it seemed like I heard the words, food. Hungry. I shook it off a couple minutes later and another pebble hit the water. I heard the same words repeated again. So, being a teenager, I got a bit of a crazy idea. I took the fish out of the water and walked about 10 feet up into the woods and laid it down. I went back to my chair and sat down. I heard something moving in the woods. Sure enough, the next morning, my stringer was hanging in the tree again. I fished several more times, but nothing odd occurred. But two weeks later my fishing buddy was back after a couple. Pebbles hit the water at the stringer. I hung it, with fish, on a limb at the edge of the woods. About 10 minutes later I heard a big limb break. The one with the fish was gone. I started taking two stringers just in case I finally got to see him. The week before school started back only, for maybe 5 seconds, I caught a glimpse of a 7 foot tall, mass of shaggy reddish brown hair. This continued on for a couple summers. I finally broke down and told my grandpa. He just smiled and said he figured that's what I was doing with the fish. I was stunned. The next time I went fishing my grandpa gave me a bag of vegetables out of his garden. He told me to leave them with the fish. Grandpa said he saw him a couple times over the years. When my grandparents passed away my aunt sold the land to a logging company. I'm 56 now and never got to go back. The year was 1978, late October. I was 12 years old. Three kids and I, two of them younger than me, one was a year older, were walking down a trail, alongside a bean field, near our neighborhood near Oklahoma City. We were looking for used shotgun shells, as we would collect them as kids, so we were looking at the ground most of the time as we were walking along. We were getting close to the line of woods that surrounded the bean field. I heard one of the other kids let out a scream and take off running right past me as fast as he could. I had my back turned to whatever he was running from. As I turned around to see what he was so scared of, the other two kids raced by me yelling for me to run. They were crying and had a look of fear on their faces. Standing about 25 to 30 feet away from me, was a headless man, or person. This person or figure was about 6 foot 3 inches or so and was wearing a belt of bullets, bandolier. The type of bullet belt that crosses over your shoulder, like the ones from the old movie The Good, The Bad and The Ugly. The figure had some type of uniform on, it looked like an old Civil War uniform, a blue jacket and a white collar around his neck, and again, he had no head. The figure wore black boots up to his knees. I didn't see a gun or a weapon of any kind. I froze for about 5 seconds as I was looking at this figure, right before I turned to run from this thing. The figure raised its hand and pointed a finger at me. As I looked very closely at this figure's hand, I noticed it was snow white in color. The color was so white, like he dipped his hand in a bucket of flour. I took off running into the woods and met another one of the kids, who was hiding from this figure. We sat there and watched as this figure walked down along the trail next to the bean field. It walked into the woods, across from where we were hiding, never to be seen again. I ran home and told my dad what I had seen. We went back and found footprints in the dirt where we had seen the figure walk. This area was the woods where I grew up and loved being out there, I still go back to this day to walk around. We would ride dirt bikes and play games in these woods and older kids would have parties, campfires, and other stuff. I never saw anything like that again, but I didn't go back again that fall. This is a true story and I don't know what we saw. Maybe someone was playing a trick on us, but if so, they went into a great amount of detail to do it. I have a girlfriend who, basically, careened off the road. She was driving along in a van. 
She had a couple of her kids with her and she just lost control on one of these roads up in central interior Ecuador. She was going over a large embankment. It was a cliff, you know, a really serious situation. From out of nowhere, this is the story she told me, it was her own personal experience and she's a real straight shooter too. These giant wings appeared from out of nowhere just as she was going over this steep embankment or cliff with her kids and these giant wings just covered the van from the front and stopped her just as she was heading off to face her doom. Things would not have worked out too well for her and her family. Have you ever heard of a thunderbird or angel being? God only knows what, arriving out of nowhere and saving people. A sort of benevolent entity or force, but something helpful? She is totally confused by what occurred. She is grateful but fears that it may be an entity that she will encounter again. Her kids don't recall what happened, which may be a blessing. It was the summer of 2000 in Knox County, Missouri near a small village called Colony and just north of there, the North Fabius River where there is a concrete bridge. I would fish on this small river, a lot of times underneath the bridge where there was usually a pretty good deep hole to fish. One night, I was fishing just on the east side of the bridge on the south bank and as I was watching my poles, I heard a loud crashing sound straight across the river from me, something crashing through the trees. I looked directly in that direction and see this large object flying through the air and down to the river. Mostly what I'm observing when I first catch sight of this thing are enormous wings and this thing lands right in the middle of the river where there is a sandbar that divides basically two small channels in the river. It lands just to the left of where my line is cast out, maybe 20 feet or so. It was most definitely dark but there was enough light from a burning citronella candle bucket I had burning to where I could see most of the outline of whatever it was I was seeing. I will never forget the size of the wings and how it landed just like a bird. The wings were most likely white or at least light enough I could make them out pretty easy but it stood just as a man and had the body of a man. The wings were enormous and were possibly as tall if not taller than the body by a foot or two. It looked mostly naked from what I could tell but I saw some kind of chest straps that went across its chest. I could not see a face but it looked like it was wearing some kind of helmet and face shield and I say this because it looked exactly like the face shield of the DC comic superhero Hawkman. It had a pointed face shield that looked like a bird's face and just like the Hawkman character, it had wing-like pieces on its helmet. It looked like a helmet because it appeared to be a different color or shade than its body. After it had landed, it stood straight up and had its wings tucked in and it didn't move for a very long time but I could see water stirring up. I just kept staring at it, afraid to move. I can't say how much time passed but it seemed like a long time that I watched it. All of a sudden I saw it moving even more and it looked like it had a large vase in its hand and was dipping it into the water and started pouring water on itself on its right wing. To me, it seemed like it must have been injured because of the way it crashed through the trees. That's what it appeared like anyway. After it did that, it stood straight and didn't move at all. It stood there for the longest time and looked more like a post because it was so still. I watched it for at least another 20 to 30 minutes and it did not move. I was scared and I just kept thinking in my mind that it had to be able to see me or at least see the citronella bucket burning. I started to tell myself that what I was seeing wasn't real. I had two poles with me at the time but only one was cast out and the one that was cast out, I just started reeling it in nice and slow while keeping my eye on this thing. At this time, the wind is blowing the candle directly into my face and it's all I can breathe in once I finally get my pole reeled in. I grab the candle bucket and move it from the right of me to the left. All of a sudden I see this thing leap and jump into the water like a dive and water splashes up and there's wake hitting the bank. I immediately grab my poles and take off running up the bank. I kept falling down, scared out of my mind in a total panic thinking this thing was behind me. I finally got past the rocks and up above the bank and onto the road and went straight for the truck. I got out of there, still thinking this thing might be following me. I was scared. I was actually scared for a very long time. Looking back now, 
Maybe the creature was just as scared as I was. Several days after witnessing two low-flying objects over his suburban Vancouver, British Columbia home, on two separate nights, one of the objects was described as huge, making a rumbling-like noise. It had a V-shaped tail with two rows of round and oblong windows and was black, gray, and silver in color, and after receiving a suspicious phone call from someone claiming to be a general from the Canadian Armed Forces, two strange men appeared at the door of the witness residence. They produced wallets, one black, and one brown, containing photo IDs that stated they were from the Canadian Air Defense. They asked to come inside. The witness extended his hand but was ignored. Moving into the house took them through the kitchen area, but they stopped upon seeing the microwave. After some questioning, the witness lowered a portion of a counter and they carefully slid through the extra space. Sitting down they produced a small silver-colored tape recorder and inserted a small disc, between a nickel and a quarter in size. On entering the house one of the men had noticed an unusual walking stick in the hallway, to which he remarked that the head of the stick's carving, painted red, reminded him of primates back home. The two men were olive-skinned and appeared to have slanted eyes. Each wore glasses with thick rims. They wore gray suits with black shirts, one had a white tie, and the other was buttoned up to the neck. The one with the tie had a clip that contained a red stone that flickered. The other had a ruby ring surrounded with diamonds. His watch was square but without apparent hands, instead being encircled with buttons that periodically illuminated from white to green to mauve. The strap appeared to be molded into the skin and was a solid steel band. The belt on his pants was of metallic strips with a square buckle. Both had very large feet, estimated to be 14 inches. Each carried a briefcase that was heavy and cold. When sitting down they never relaxed into their chairs but retained a stiff back the whole time. Not once during their stay in the house did they speak to each other. The witness two cats were extremely agitated the whole time during the visitor's stay. Also, the owner's dog that lived upstairs barked during the whole episode. The men noticed that the witness was wearing a very unusual watch and one of them touched his arm. The touch felt very cold and clammy. They questioned the witness about his sightings, and one of them appeared to be taking shorthand notes. When they questioned him they looked into his eyes and seemed to pierce his brain. As they were leaving they again carefully avoided the microwave. Outside in the yard they spent about 30 minutes scouring the ground with a Geiger counter. As they rounded the corner of the house the witness went from the kitchen to the bedroom, which gave him a clearer view of the driveway and the road. Despite the very short period it took him to achieve this, the two men were not in sight, nor was a car leaving, or no car door could be heard slamming, they had vanished. Later they discovered that on the windowsill, only six inches behind where one of the men had been sitting, was a Windex bottle and was partially melted as if heat had been applied to it. Alongside was a cassette warp similarly. The witness suffered from a severe migraine-type headache after the two men left, his eyes also felt gritty and teary, and his face now appeared sunburned. He also suffered from strange dreams, one that was of lying prone on a table in a round room with a bright light above him and then sensing being touched. Two days later, while going outside his house the witness saw the same two men he had seen before in the driveway. Both were dressed in white coveralls. One was carrying a Geiger counter, the other a 12 to 16 inch parabolic dish in his hand, pointing to the sky, plus earphones and a microphone that was attached. He appeared to be searching the sky. The wires all led into a black box at his waist. At one point he had what looked like a camera, although not video, aimed at a tree over which the UFO had been originally seen. During the time they were together neither was seen speaking to each other nor was any car scene which they might have arrived in. In December, a few days after Christmas, a man appeared at the door of the witness. He stated that he had come to see his unusual watch. He stated that his name was Mr. Smith and showed some ID. He wore a dark charcoal suit, a white shirt, and a black tie. He also wore a black fedora. 
His feet were very large, size 13, or 14, like the witness's previous visitors. His shoes were black and shiny, with no signs of dirt on them at all. He was about 4 feet 8 inches to 5 feet tall, very thin, and very pale skin with very long fingers. He also wore black wraparound glasses with silver frames. The witness extended his hand but was ignored, again. Upon entering the house the visitor commented upon the carved walking stick in the hallway. He also asked the witness to turn the microwave off before he walked in front of it. Sitting down at the kitchen table he produced a small silver tape recorder, claiming it could record up to 80 hours or more. Using a pick-like tool from his breast pocket he examined the witness watch. He opened a black briefcase, removed some paper, a silver pencil with a red top, and a pen-like flashlight that emitted a mauve, pencil-thin beam, which scanned the interior of the watch. He took a small digital type camera and with it he took several pictures of the watch. During the whole of his visit, he spoke very little, and his speech seemed slurred. Again the cats were agitated during the stranger's visit. He again expressed interest in the watch and the witness asked $500 for it, but he replied that he had to check with his colleagues. The stranger also expressed interest in a computer saying that it had very minimal power. The stranger departed without saying goodbye. The witness went immediately to the window but could not see any sign of the visitor or any car in the vicinity, he had simply vanished. A plastic hair blower nozzle was found melted and a ruler in a drawer close to where the visitor had been sitting was bent into a slight curve. Again the witness suffered from a severe headache and an eruptive nosebleed. In early January 2001, two peculiar strangers again visited the witness to a previous UFO encounter. These two were different from the others. They were at least six feet tall, and very bony, with heads, hands, and feet out of proportion to the rest of the body. They wore gray suits that seemed to be oily, and had black ties and hats plus wraparound sunglasses that they never took off. When questioned about the glasses they remarked that they could see perfectly well. Their ears stood out from their heads and their skin was pale white, whereas their fingernails were gray in color. They never removed the hats during their visit. And throughout the whole time, only one of them spoke. When asked for IDs they displayed silver cases that contained a photo of an unusual symbol, plus their names in small print. Upon entering the kitchen they asked the witness to please unplug the microwave, they also told him to turn the computer off. The two Persian cats were going crazy dashing around the room and trying to get out of the window, which was closed. Each man carried a briefcase with an inverted L-shaped handle. The man who did all the talking asked to see the witness's unusual watch, he then removed from his briefcase four small containers, each had a different colored top. Opening two he proceeded to pour the contents over the watch. He told the concerned witness that no harm would come to the watch. He was given $250 for the watch and told that they would give him the rest later. He told them that he was moving soon, to this they replied, we know, don't worry, we can find you if we want to. They soon departed without the common courtesies, staring blankly at the witness as he extended his hand. Once again the witness hurried to the bedroom window only to find, as before, no sign of either man departing, nor could any vehicle be heard leaving. After the visit, the witness felt drained, had a severe headache that lasted for two days, and a rash on his arms, face, and chest. I along with my cousin C.W., were on our way home by the lake road when we decided to pause and enjoy the sight of shooting stars. To our surprise, when we reached home, we discovered that approximately three hours were unaccounted for. The next morning, I experienced a sore stomach and a highly inflamed navel, while CW had a small puncture mark on her spine surrounded by four little marks. During regressive hypnosis, I recollected encountering four short individuals dressed in black snowmobile suits with helmets covering their heads. Simultaneously, there was a helmet-shaped object hovering over a field, measuring 30 to 40 feet in diameter featuring a prominent white light in the middle and smaller lights recessed around it. 
Somehow, I found myself outside the car, and these beings approached, pulling at my arm. The next memory was being inside a room with a rounded door, accompanied by a chrome cylinder. A nurse with a face mask and big black eyes, alongside a doctor, presented a needle. Despite my attempt to escape, I was caught, fastened to a cot, and the needle was inserted into my stomach. In the same room, several individuals with grayish-white, cat-like faces, adorned in cream-colored robes, appeared. They had scaly skin, long fingernails, small noses, and no visible mouths. The room was filled with various controls and gauges, reaching up to the ceiling, as the craft was in flight. I observed a man of normal appearance bending over CW and noted a pedestal chair and a box with lines across it, akin to a TV. For about 10 minutes, I witnessed scenes on the box, including a crying baby, a war, people in the jungle with knives, and other scenarios. The memories continued with leaving the craft and returning, along with CW, to the car. In September 1978, I lived with my father on a farm in the vicinity of Shawano, Wisconsin which is very near the Menominee Indian Reservation. There had been some buzz within the community of an unknown large hairy creature spotted by two deer hunters not far from our farm. I had heard stories of the Manabai Walk or the giants from stories told by the Menominee, but I just considered these tales to be legends. Then one evening, my father and I were coming home from the store and noticed what appeared to be two hairy creatures collecting squash from the garden. Each creature was at least six feet tall. It was dusk but there was enough light to clearly see what they were doing. My father immediately cut the headlights and stopped the car as we just sat there and watched them pick and eat the squash. They didn't seem to even notice us, even though we were about 100 feet from them. After about five minutes, one of the creatures looked in our direction and you could see its eyes glow red from the moonlight. We started to get scared and decided to dash for the house and call the police. Then suddenly, huge disc-shaped objects appeared above us and slowly moved towards the east field which was about 200 hundred yards from us, and landed. I estimate the craft was about 40 feet in diameter. A large sliding door opened immediately and a foggy green light glowed from within the craft. After a few seconds, the door closed and the craft slowly rose and shot off toward the north. Then we noticed that the creatures were gone. A few days later, our neighbors from down the road came over for dinner. After we finished eating, my father and Mr. C walked outside. After an hour or so, the neighbors left and I started to clean up the kitchen. Later that evening, I was watching TV in the living room. My father walked in turned off the TV, and sat down beside me. He told me that Mr. C and his sister witnessed one of the craft on the same night that we had our encounter. As well, they witnessed several of the large hairy creatures meandering in the nearby woods. Mr. C said that he knew something had been in the woods for several weeks but never got a good look until the craft arrived. After that night, we never had another encounter nor did we hear of more sightings by any people in the area. Do you think that these creatures were Bigfoot, aliens, or one and the same? It has always seemed strange to me that a Bigfoot body has never been found. Is it a possibility that Bigfoot is an extraterrestrial being? I'd like to tell you a bit about two things that recently happened to me, regarding music in a forest close to my house. I'll set the scene first. There's this forest close to my house that I often walk in, alone or with my family. It was being used in World War II, so there are a few military bunkers around. The forest is quite long and there are not many houses around, in some areas, there are none. Now, this first encounter with the strange forest was about a year ago. I was walking, going a bit further than I usually would alone. I explored a bit, then walk and back. There was this large field I passed. It had a bunker in it, I took a look. In it were a couple of roe deer bones and some half-smoked cigarettes. Nothing out of the ordinary. This was one they'd forgotten to close up, 
so you could go inside. There was nothing strange or out of the ordinary in the bunker either. I left it and continued walking. Keep in mind that this was one of those areas where there were no houses nearby. I walked, and suddenly my heart dropped, I heard music. Very clear, vintage sounding music, like from the 20s or 30s. I was terrified. I walked further, thinking it was my imagination, but it wasn't. To continue on to the regular path I had to climb a little hill that was quite muddy, but I couldn't get on it. I had to keep walking trough the field, without the path. I was so scared, I thought there was someone hiding in the trees, waiting for me. But, there wasn't. I took out my phone, took some videos and sent them to my friend. She could hear it too. I walked home. But, I thought it was just a weird coincidence. But last week, it happened again. A twig snapped, and the music started playing when I was walking back home, at the same exact place. I ran back home, which took about 20 minutes. It was the same music. I am still scared. Can anyone please debunk this? I'm not a big paranormal person, but I remain open-minded. I was dog-sitting for my upstairs neighbor over Christmas. Some background, her father was up there in hospice care and passed away about a year ago. Anyway, I go upstairs to walk the dogs a few times a day over the long Christmas weekend. One time after a walk I go into my bathroom and I'm taking a piss when I feel a hand on my right shoulder. It really felt like a hand, sure maybe a muscle spasm, with some gentle pressure. Then my body went ice cold. I wasn't scared at all. It was a friendly touch, almost as if to say, good job son. I don't know, just felt like sharing. Let me tell you what happened. I was at my parents' home for a few days while they were away on a trip. I was watching their dog. On the day they were returning from their trip, I was in the living room watching TV. It was morning. Very bright outside. I was with the dog. I was watching a YouTube video of someone playing a game. I have previously watched this person before. While I was watching the person on YouTube, the living room door was open. After watching the video for many minutes, I stood up off the sofa and was in a position where I could see out the living room door and into the hallway. In the hallway, I could see a bedroom door on the left and a bedroom straight ahead. The entrance to the apartment is just right of the bedroom straight ahead. When I looked at the bedroom at the end of the hallway, which is my parents' bedroom, their bedroom door was halfway open. I looked at that door for about one second and I saw something. It was small. Dark colored. It was as if there might be more of it behind the door. When I realized I had saw something, it was only for a second before it moved behind the door. The time it took and the way this thing moved out of my view felt similar to how you might feel if you were watching someone and they caught you doing it. Although it was small, I thought I was looking at the head of something. I was very unsettled by whatever it was. I have never experienced something like that. The next thing I did was go into the kitchen, grabbed a knife and went into my parents' bedroom. I never found anyone or anything in there. I was 18, my friend 16. I had just graduated high school and we decided to go camping overnight. Both of us are female, but it was a safe area close to home, so we weren't worried. We were making dinner when a man with fishing gear walks into view of our campsite from up the canyon in the river. He asked if he could cut through our sight to the road. Nothing seemed unusual, so we said sure. He stopped in the middle of our sight and asked us what we were making. Really just made polite small talk. But then his questions started getting uncomfortable. How old are you guys? Where are you from? How long are you planning to be up here? Is it just you two up here? I'll admit, some little part of me felt uneasy, but my friend and I were naive. We answered every single question and even offered the guy some food. He declined the food and headed out of our campsite and down the canyon. A couple hours later, 
He and another middle-aged man walk up the canyon, from the direction the first man left in, and strolled right into our campsite. The first one took us up on our earlier offer for some dinner and really just sat there. The new guy asked us a lot of questions, most along the same vein as the first guy. This felt uncomfortable. I was uneasy, but I didn't want to be rude. After a while, they thanked us for the chat and left our campsite, heading up the canyon, away from where we assumed they were camped. This is when subtle alarm bells became a little less subtle. My friend and I ate and sat by the fire well into the evening past dark, laughing and having fun. However, B both watched the road the whole time, and those men never went back down the canyon. Now I can see that they may have simply had a fishing base lower in the canyon and their campsite higher, but every ounce of self-preservation was on edge at this point. My intuition screamed for me to reconsider. I was desperate to enjoy this camping trip though, and I didn't set anything. But God, the tension was thick in the air between my friend and I. We were both uneasy and did what we could to fill the silence between us. Eventually she said you know the worst part about camping by a river? My stomach sank. Of course I knew. Here in northern Utah where the rivers are fed largely by runoff and they traipse down steep mountains, they are loud. You can't hear anything over them. I responded. She nodded. You think we should leave, don't you? She said she didn't feel good about the situation. At this point in our lives, we were both staunch Mormons, I am no longer, so we said a prayer. I now see this as me consciously and fully welcoming the voice of my intuition into my decision-making process. Clear as day, we both knew we had to get out. As soon as we really stopped pushing down that intuition in favor of having a fun night, all bets were off. Terror filled us and we threw everything haphazardously into my car before booking it down the canyon. The terror wouldn't leave us until we got off the dirt road of the canyon fork onto the main paved road out of the mountains into town. We both watched the rear view the whole time, praying we never saw headlights behind us. As soon as we had a signal, we called my dad and told him what had happened. He told us to get the hell out of there and make sure we weren't being followed. We ended up sleeping, safe and sound, in my friend's backyard that night. Knowing what I do now as a sequel assault therapist, I am almost certain those men had ill intentions for us that night. So I've been a huge fan of this and other similar Reddit pages for years now and finally have a fitting story of my own. Quick bit of backstory me 32 male, my brother, 28 male, and disabled mom all lived together in a trailer about 30 minutes from Nashville, Tennessee. I was wary of moving there at first for the stereotypes you may hear about trailer parks but luckily we've had zero issues in the 10 years we've been here very nice neighbors, well kept yards, ect ect. Ok story time so about a week ago we were finally putting up our Christmas tree drinking probably too much beer, listening to Christmas music, Christmas spirit in full swing. During our random banner my brother says oh yeah I can't believe I forgot to tell you earlier today at work the owner had to kick out some guy who was acting super creepy. My brother works as the stalker at a family owned little market about a mile from our home. He went on to tell me this younger looking guy was pacing the aisles, sometimes standing still for minutes at a time and not responding when the owner would ask if he needed help finding something. After about 20 minutes of this the owner asked him to please leave because he was scaring the customers and without a word he left. We continue with our good time hanging ornaments, drinking, getting our mom involved, with the ornaments not the drinking of course lol, and all is good. We wrap up around 10.30 pm help our mom to bed, she's in a wheelchair, and decide we might as well finish off the ton of beer we have left and admire our decked out tree. Around 11.30 we decide to go out on the front porch to share a cigarette as we usually do when we've tied on a good buzz. My brother opens the door and almost immediately closes it. I ask what's up and he says holy shit the guy I was telling you about just like Michael Myers walked down the street past our house. I thought that was pretty strange but wasn't super concerned. 
We waited for a few minutes then went and smoked as usual and went back inside. My brother and I aren't troublemakers at all but I'm pretty confident in our ability to defend ourselves if we had to. At this point these are just thoughts in the back of my mind though after all I hadn't even seen this guy, yet. Fast forward to about 2 am. We're more than drunk enough to go ahead and call it a night after one more Siggy. My brother opens the door and within seconds I hear him say whoa whoa hey man you good? Hey buddy what's up? You good? I'm in the kitchen at the time but quickly decided this doesn't sound right and rush over to the door. What I see when I get to the open door is a younger man standing on our deck about 3 feet from our front door. He's pretty tall about 6 foot 4 and another thing I noticed is he looks a lot like Adam Driver which was a detail my brother jokingly mentioned earlier during tree time so I'm realizing for the first time this must be the guy he's been talking about. One thing my brother must have not got close enough to notice at work though was this guy's eyes. I'm not exaggerating when I say I've never seen anything like it. His body language wasn't super menacing but his eyes were the strangest combination of wide-eyed bewilderment and fury, like us opening our front door confused him and also made him very very angry. I joined my brother in explaining to him that it's late and he should head home. After what I'd say was about 30 seconds of staring he just walked off without a word. I peeked out of our blinds to make sure he really left and saw nothing. We both tried to laugh it off and were saying things like well that was pretty weird huh? But it took a while for my adrenaline to taper off. The thing I kept thinking to myself that bothered me was those 30 seconds to me felt like he was the one deciding what the next move would be, but what that could have been I have no idea. I also didn't love that my brother said when he opened the door he was already standing there, so for how long? We calmed down watching YouTube videos and after another 30 minutes or so I say to my brother okay man let's just go to bed I'll take one more look outside to be safe but felt like it wasn't really necessary. I open the door and he's back again. The street lights are spaced very far apart in our trailer park but at the edge of our driveway there I see a silhouette probably 50 feet away again just staring at our front door. I feel I should mention he's not there texting or on the phone with someone, he's just there. I feel bad in hindsight because I'm sure this poor guy definitely has mental health issues but between being drunk and exhausted and the look he gave us earlier I was over it. I finally put some bass in my voice and said hey man you can't just stand in our driveway, you're being creepy dude just please leave I really don't want to call the cops on you so don't make me. This seemed to work his demeanor didn't change at all but the word cops seemed to do the trick, he turned around and walked away. I hope we handled it well. I understand and empathize with people with mental health problems and have friends and family who unfortunately suffer from those things. However, I still can't shake the feeling that something bad could have happened that night. He didn't finally leave our porch earlier that night until I showed up to the door essentially making him outnumbered. And even then still he came back after. I hope he's okay out there we haven't seen him since. I also hope not calling the police wasn't a bad choice and that he isn't out there with bad intentions on somebody else's front deck at 2am who lives alone or is elderly ex. I wish I could have figured out what that was all about but during every interaction me or my brother had with him that day and night he never spoke a word. Pretty creepy. Thanks for reading. Hope I did a decent job conveying my story this is my first reddit post ever so I don't know I hope it's an easy read happy holidays everybody. When I was around 12. I lived with my mother in a granny flat connected to the old person's house, built by his son. Let's call the neighbor Harry. There were three ways to enter the yard, one from Harry's backyard, one by the driveway, and the other through one of the walls, aka the main entrance. The gate at the driveway was broken, and we kept Harry's gate blocked. Harry was an odd guy, around 70, and always gave me and my mom the creeps. I remember one day when my mom and I were outside, he started talking to us over the gate and got on what we later learned was a step stool. My mom told me to go inside. Another time, when I was taking the rubbish out, I turned around, and he was behind me, just staring. I tried to leave, 
but he dragged me into a conversation. After a while, my mom showed up and asked what was taking so long. When she saw Harry, she told me to go into the house, and when she came back, she instructed me to run away if he ever did that again. The third thing I remember is when I was at home alone, and I heard the gate open. I took a look outside and saw Harry walking around the yard. I ran to my mom's room and stayed quiet. After a while, I heard knocking, then the gate opened and shut, indicating he left. The final issue was when my mom and I were mowing the lawn, and I felt like I was being watched. I looked up, and there was Harry standing near his back door, our flat was visible from the door, just staring. After a minute, my mom realized I was staring at something and looked up. She immediately got mad, telling me to get inside and lock the door. My mom started yelling at him, saying, what are you doing? Go away. Leave us alone. If you keep this up, I'm calling the cops. I don't really remember what happened next, but after a few months, we moved, and it was the biggest relief ever. My mom told the son what had happened after she yelled at him, and I'm guessing the son told his dad to leave us alone, but it was definitely creepy. Story time. I'm not really a believer in ghosts, but let me just say that right now. However, I saw something that I cannot explain one night while working the night shift as a park ranger. I was patrolling a very wooded area, a very popular camping spot. This was in central Illinois. I won't tell you the park name. It's always been weird to me because this place is usually packed during the day, but at night, it's different. Not that many campers stay overnight here. So this was right around 1.30 in the morning, and I just started my second round of patrolling. I see this tall, dark figure standing near an old cabin on one of the trails. For whatever reason, I thought it was a mannequin somebody had left out here for a prank, just because of the way it looked and how still it was. I got closer and realized I was wrong in my judgment. It was moving, very slowly though. But as soon as I shined my light on it, it didn't have a face, no eyes, no nose, no mouth, nothing. It was just this dark silhouette with what appeared to be arms and legs and looked just like a human, only in shape, of course. It was completely black. The figure also appeared to have some sort of cloak or cape draped over him or her. So obviously, I'm trying my best not to panic. My mind is racing with possible explanations for this thing. Perhaps some mischievous college students dressed in cloaks playing a prank, perhaps I'm hallucinating. Either way, it's creeping me out, and I want no part of whatever this thing is. But before I can turn around and walk away or run for that matter, this thing picks up speed and begins to run towards me. This thing gets about 20 feet from me and leaps up about 30 feet into the air, up into the trees, like some sort of wild animal. Now I am freaking out, and panic is setting in. I'm obviously not dealing with a regular person. This is something else entirely, and like some wild, crazy animal, it's jumping around on all fours from tree to tree, following me, keeping parallel with me as I'm running back to my truck. I run as fast as my legs could take me but found myself near the campground's entrance, where I made a break for my truck, jumping inside and locking the door behind. I just sat there in silence for about 3 to 5 minutes, trying to catch my breath, thinking to myself, I hope that thing leaves. I was too afraid to even shoot at it, and I had no idea how I'm ever going to report this. I mean, number one, who's gonna believe me, and number two, my superiors are probably gonna mock me and ridicule me. I could even lose my job if I reported such a thing, or maybe they even speculate that I was on drugs. So I kind of just sat there and sank in my seat, not sure how I should go about telling about this. This was easily one of the creepiest and most paranormal things I've ever experienced on the job. I never saw it again after that. Thank God. Bind Park Ranger is unfortunately a job that's filled with tragedy a lot of the time, but we believe and suspect that a man had gotten lost and disoriented. 
making a wrong turn sometime during the middle of the night, falling to his death after trying to climb up almost a sheer cliff. We found his backpack about 20 yards from where he had passed, but there were no clues as to where his body might have gone. It's like he just vanished into thin air. We're not sure how long his body had been there or if maybe he was killed, but we found no signs of animal interference. A ranger who asked to remain nameless claims they heard the man screaming during the night while they were near the scene. When they decided to check it out, they found nothing. I know this sounds crazy, but I do think something happened. When we arrived at the scene, all my dog would do was whine and stare at the rock wall. He didn't bark or anything like he normally does. It seemed like he wanted me to follow him, so I did. We ended up having to climb the steep cliff face with almost zero holds in order to get to the man. That's if the man was actually there, though he wasn't. We could only speculate that the man fell to his death, hence the blood in his backpack. But then there's the question, where's his body? Why is it gone? Near Diamond Lake, right on Rough Creek where it converges with Fish Creek, near the breathtaking Tokatee Falls, I embarked on a deer hunting adventure with my teenage son. Upon reaching our campsite, a realization struck us, we had forgotten our tent poles. Undeterred, after hiking around and having dinner, we resigned ourselves to sleeping on the ground. In deference to the dry conditions, we refrained from lighting a campfire. As the night unfolded, I drifted into a deep sleep, oblivious to the tranquility around us. However, my slumber was abruptly disrupted by a peculiar sensation on my beard. At the time, I sported a voluminous beard and mustache, coupled with long hair. It felt as if something were gently running fingers through my facial hair, not with the intention of waking me, but as though attempting to ascertain my identity. I likened it to a blind person delicately exploring the contours of a face to see through touch. Oddly, my first thoughts turned to a squirrel or another critter. Amidst this curious interaction, an unmistakable and overwhelming odor engulfed the air, a pungent mixture of burnt hair and decomposing meat. The intensity of the scent heightened my senses. With a sudden jolt, I sat up and roared, hoping to startle whatever unseen presence was exploring my facial hair. In response, it swiftly retreated into the thick underbrush, avoiding any need to cross the nearby dirt and gravel paths. The reverberations of its departure were unmistakable, crashing through the foliage on two legs, emitting a distinct impression of size and weight. Once I regained my bearings, I reached for a flashlight, eager to investigate the ground for any trace of tracks left by this mysterious visitor. Much to my surprise, there were none to be found. This encounter, unlike typical Bigfoot sightings, did not unfold through visual cues, instead, it was experienced through scent, touch, and sound. Reflecting on this uncanny episode and exchanging stories with others who have ventured into the woods, I am increasingly convinced that I had a close encounter with a Bigfoot that memorable evening. Additionally, it's worth noting that the area through which the Bigfoot made its hasty escape was blanketed in dry leaves, amplifying the noise as it navigated through the underbrush. The unmistakable crunch of leaves underscored the creature's departure, leaving an indelible mark on the memory of that eerie night in the Oregon wilderness. My name is Kale, and this is a story about the first time that I saw a werewolf. It happened when I was a little boy, around 8 to 11 years old. I lived in Estonia, and I still do, with my stepfather, mother, older sister, younger brother, and our dog. We had gone to our summer home, a beautiful old house that my parents had bought. We had added new windows to it because it didn't have any. One night, my sister and I decided to sleep in a tent, so our stepfather set it up, and we spent the night in there. I was a little nervous because I had heard that the forest near our house had bears. Still, my mother assured me that bears don't come close to humans, and, well, she was right. What I saw wasn't a bear. Around midnight, when my sister was sleeping, I had to go to the bathroom. 
So, I got out and walked pretty far from the house to do my business. When I finished, I heard a howl and screeching. I looked around but didn't see anything. I thought it was in my head because I really liked werewolves and wolves, but there were no wolves in our forest, not that I would know. But I had asked my mother. I just felt like something or someone was staring at me, watching me. I started to walk back to the tent when I heard a scream that still haunts me. It was a scream of a deer, but it sounded like it was drowning. A few minutes later, I heard rustling in the bushes. I looked toward the big bush near me, roughly 50 feet away, and saw an animal with red-yellow glowing eyes looking directly at me. I thought it might be a neighbor's dog, but they lived a few miles away, and the dog wasn't as big as this creature. So, I was startled because my second thought was a bear, and I didn't move because I knew when you meet a wild animal, you can't turn your back to it. So, you have to walk away slowly backward. But when I tried, I wounded my foot, and that thing growled loudly, preventing me from walking away. I was afraid, knowing that it wasn't a bear, bears don't growl like that. I stood there, this thing staring at me, and I started to smell a rotten stink mixed with blood. It growled again with even more intensity. A few minutes, which felt like hours, had gone by when something happened that I could only dream of. The thing stood on its back legs, and I saw what it looked like. Like I said, I was a big fan of werewolves but didn't think I would meet one. It was about 8 to 8 and a half feet tall with red yellowish eyes, covered in fur. Its upper body had longer fur than the lower part, and it looked like a man but was bigger and had a tail and a wolf or German shepherd's head. The thing stared at me for more minutes and came closer. It had black claws and brown fur and sniffed me really close, about five feet away, and then stopped. It showed me its teeth by opening its mouth, and then I saw how its teeth were covered in blood. I think it sensed how scared I was because I was crying. Then, it turned around and walked toward the forest. But before it went in, it turned around and looked at me, as if seeing if I was still watching. It held its gaze and ran into the forest. When it was gone, I finally got my body to move, and I walked to my tent with my heart pounding in my chest. I finally got in, and I could feel the tears running down my face. I kept thinking about it and couldn't believe what I saw. I tried to fall asleep, and when I woke up in the morning, I wasn't sure if it was real or if I just had an intense dream. It felt so real, and at night, there was a full moon. When I checked my foot, I saw a wound that I got last night, and I believed it was real. I haven't told anyone the story yet because I don't like it when people say that I make stuff up, like with my other stories. But I saw it for real. Now that I'm older and watching videos of true werewolf encounters, I believe I really did see a werewolf. I haven't seen any more of them, of course, but who knows. I have seen a kind of unknown winged creature in Loma Linda, California. I only saw it one time and was using a pair of binoculars at night when I noticed the silhouette of, what at first appeared to me, as an airplane drone. It swooped upwards and had a very large wingspan that was closer to a flying wing configuration. It swung back over and headed in my direction. At the time, I estimated it to be less than a quarter mile away. I kept my binoculars on this aircraft looking dark silhouette as it came in my direction but appeared to be lined up with a main street that passes by my location about 200 feet away. At the time I was thinking I had just spotted some kind of police surveillance drone and wasn't concerned. It had reached an altitude of 150 to 200 feet during its wing over heading back towards me and was in a descent that had reached my level of about 15 feet when passed by but was following the street. It was traveling at least 50 miles per hour and didn't have a discernible sound from a propeller. As it went past I was startled by the noticeable red glow of its eye. The silhouette as it passed by appeared bird-like. It looked like a black eagle or hawk but at least 8 or more feet in body length and a wingspan of at least 12 feet. It passed behind some trees as I followed it and expected to see it come into view while silhouetted against the large illuminated hospital structures. 
To this day I can still visualize the glowing red eye that seemed to be looking at me like it knew I was watching it. This happened around 2014. I rationalized it as being some kind of aircraft but that silhouette resembled a bird and the glowing red eye. It wasn't right. I am not making this up and would like to know if anyone else in my area has seen something like I described. I was out at my grandparents' house, hunting coyotes, as usual, this time of year. I was hiking through my next door neighbor's land, to get to the wood covered land in the back. While I was hiking, I got the feeling I was being followed by something to my right. I stopped and switched the red tin on my headlamp to my spotlight but didn't see anything. Then I switched back to my headlamp and pulled my rifle back up and continued my hike. It was 6.15 am and the sun was just coming up. I was sitting in a hide I'd made the day before. That's when I saw something behind a group of trees on my left. It was crouched. I raised my rifle, looked through my scope and froze when I saw the creature staring back at me. I panicked and fired a shot off. That's when it stood up and took off, deeper into the woods. I sat there probably another 25 minutes before I decided it was safe to head in and did so. Later that day, I grabbed my grandfather and we both went out to where I had seen the creature when it stood up on two legs and took off. We measured where I had seen it and it was roughly seven half feet tall. To this day, I'm terrified to go out at night or in the early morning hours. There are poultry farms located east of Shreveport. In November of 2017 there have been incidents of dogman encounters on this farm. The footprints, dead chicken sightings and even the farmers shooting at the creature with shotguns, rifles and pistols video was taken by one of the overseers on duty. What is bad? Is that there are several other farms over the area that have had these werewolf encounters and it's bad for business exclamation mark we must have the wildlife agents deal with tracking them to their lair of residence and terminating the damn things. The frequency of incidents is more and more. These farmers are not in the mood to have their lives torn by these dogmen and unless dealt with now. They will do more damage, as far as being broadcast to the general public about these demons and their doings. They are not informed and the capers that prevail are unchecked by most area farmers and residents. This story should be a wake-up call for the law enforcement community and the area farmers as well as the citizens to make a stand against these Vea Wolf dogman encounters. On May 21, 2014, at around 7.30 p.m. in Levine, Arizona, while sitting at our dining table having dinner, my wife, my 17-year-old daughter, and I saw what we thought was a flying humanoid pass by our sliding glass door window. My daughter stated that out of the corner of her eye, she saw a brown mass swoop past the window but did not see any detail, only that it was big and covered the window area. I also saw a brown mass and as I turned to look it seemed like a pair of large legs, swooped down, through my sprinklers, and heading in a westerly direction. My wife, who was facing the door directly, said she saw a human figure as well. She stated that it flew toward the ground. She said it was dark brown and looked as if the person was lying face down with their arms to their sides. She estimated the body length at 6 to 7 feet and that the wingspan was at least twice the length of the body. I immediately ran to the door and ran outside to look. I did not see anything more but also didn't see any birds. Later that night, my wife and I both heard flapping sounds coming from the backyard. I looked out the bedroom window but did not see anything out of the ordinary. For almost a month, we would occasionally hear the flapping sounds, but were never able to catch a glimpse of the source of the sounds. I am a widow with a teenage daughter in Casper, Wyoming, west of the city near the county airport. The property had been in my husband's family for many years. I recently purchased an adjacent home and property after the owner passed away. This is where the story actually begins. 
I settled on the new property just after Thanksgiving. Since it was purchased as is it was fairly inexpensive but requires a lot of work. I hired an auction house to come in and remove the contents for future sale. The auction was scheduled for next week, but a few odd things happened when the items were first listed for sale. I received a phone call from the auctioneer a few weeks ago. He wanted to know if I had any knowledge concerning the contents of the house. I told him that I didn't know the owner that well but that I did know that he had lived on the property since the 1950s. The auctioneer said that a young woman came into the auction house and told him that the property and contents were stolen and that it belonged to her family in North Dakota. She didn't give her name but assured him that she had documentation to prove her assertions and that she planned to take legal action if the sale continued. I contacted my attorney and the realtor who verified that the property sale was legal and that there were no prior claims to it. The young woman, who was described as very plain, thin with long red hair, has not been heard from since. It was decided that the auction would continue as scheduled. Then this past Tuesday, New Year's Day around noon, someone rang the doorbell. I was in the kitchen and I knew my daughter would answer the door. I heard the door open and the voice of a young girl. My daughter soon yelled loudly mom, come here. As I walked down the hallway toward the door I noticed three girls standing on the porch. They stood without movement staring directly at me. As I approached, I was shocked when I noticed that their eyes were completely black in color. I asked if I could help them. The tallest girl asked if they could come in to talk about the house and property I had recently purchased. I immediately replied that we were busy and that I would give them the phone number of my attorney if they had any inquiries. They just turned and walked away without saying anything else. Each of the girls had blonde hair and wore heavy winter clothing with boots. They seemed to be in their early teens. I watched as they walked toward the highway and eventually lost sight of them. Since then we have not been contacted by anyone concerning the property. The auction has been postponed for other reasons and has not been rescheduled. My attorney continues to research the property records for any other information. I suppose the most important question is, who are these children? Do I need to be concerned? I look forward to your comments. Vic shared with me the tale of a discovery he made in the woods west of Napa Canyon Dam, down in Klamath County, back in August of 1979. He affectionately referred to the place as Bigfoot House. The story unfolded during a pursuit of a deer he had shot, which darted into a densely wooded thicket about 150 yards away from the road. Despite his efforts, the deer eluded him, leading Vic to stumble upon a peculiar clearing. This clearing was anything but ordinary, no grass or trees adorned the well-trodden ground, forming a rough oval spanning 30 to 40 feet. Strangely, at the north end of the oval, he encountered piles of poop, some towering 2 to 3 feet high. On the opposite end of the clearing lay a disconcerting sight, a mound of bones, ranging from bleached remnants to those still adorned with bits of flesh. The air thickened with an inexplicable tension as he took in the bizarre scene, marking the mysterious footprint of the elusive Bigfoot in the heart of Klamath County's wilderness. One chilling evening, as the moon cast an eerie glow over the desolate woods, I found myself immersed in the haunting silence of nature. The air hung heavy with an unsettling stillness, and an inexplicable unease settled upon my shoulders. Little did I know, this night would etch a harrowing encounter into the recesses of my memory. Venturing into the heart of the forest, my senses heightened with each cautious step. The shadows played tricks on my mind, distorting the trees into menacing figures that whispered ancient secrets. As I trod further, a peculiar sensation crawled up my spine, urging me to remain vigilant. Suddenly, a piercing howl shattered the silence, resonating through the dense canopy above. My heart raced in response, and beads of sweat formed on my forehead. I strained my eyes to pierce through the darkness, attempting to decipher the source of this unearthly sound. That's when I saw it, a monstrous silhouette, 
about 150 yards away. A great big, man-like ape emerged from the shadows, its dark coat blending seamlessly with the surrounding night. My breath caught in my throat as the creature's face and chest revealed a ghastly contrast, lighter, almost ghostly, in the obsidian abyss. A wave of fear washed over me, paralyzing my every instinct. The creature's eyes, pools of darkness reflecting an otherworldly intelligence, locked onto mine. Time itself seemed to pause as we shared an inexplicable connection, the veil between the known and the unknown thinning to a mere whisper. The forest, once a haven of solitude, now cocooned me in an unsettling symphony of rustling leaves and ominous whispers. I could hear my own heartbeat, a frantic rhythm mirroring the intensity of the moment. In a sudden, deliberate motion, the creature turned and vanished into the shadows from whence it came. The echoes of its departure lingered, leaving me alone with the haunting question of what secrets the woods held, secrets that transcended the boundaries of the natural world. With trembling limbs, I retraced my steps, haunted by the image of that great beast. The enigmatic encounter etched itself into the fabric of my reality, a phantom lingering at the edge of my consciousness, waiting to stir the embers of that bone-chilling night. In the days of my youth, an inexplicable encounter left an indelible mark on my memory. It happened while I was riding in a car with a friend, and the strange incident unfolded through the rearview window. As we traversed the streets, I suddenly found myself transfixed by a peculiar sight, a set of large, glowing purple eyes, eerily reminiscent of a feline gaze. Excitement and confusion gripped me as I tried desperately to draw my friend's attention to this unusual spectacle. However, my friend remained oblivious, unable to perceive the mysterious eyes that seemed to pierce through the darkness. Curiosity getting the better of them. My friend turned to investigate, only to find the eyes had vanished without a trace. Despite the disappearance, an uncanny feeling lingered, a sense that we were not alone in our peculiar encounter. As we continued our journey, an unsettling revelation unfolded. Those haunting purple eyes reappeared in the rearview mirror. Turning around to confront the inexplicable, I was met with an unsettling void, a faceless presence dominated by those luminous purple orbs. The eyes seemed to emanate from an unseen entity, perched upon the trunk of my friend's car, fixated on me with an intensity that sent shivers down my spine. Strangely, I could discern no body, no features beyond those glowing eyes. Doubt gnawed at me, and the lingering question of whether I had entered the realm of hallucination haunted my thoughts. To this day, the memory of those enigmatic purple eyes remains etched in my mind, a fleeting encounter with the unknown that defies explanation. The line between reality and imagination blurred, leaving me with an enduring mystery from the recesses of my past. I had this old man telling me this story of a cryptid. He called them tree people and described them as long lanky humanoids made of roots and moss and other foliage that secret and sweet and acrid smelling sappy substance. He said they can climb into things through their mouths and puppet them after consuming their souls. That they only possess things to feed on other things. He said he swears that him and a buddy went out hunting one summer when he was like 19 and they saw this deer chewing just above the grass not actually eating anything just chewing on air and that the eye that they could see was looking directly at them and they're blind a little ways off. The eye was unnatural for a deer mostly white with a ring of very pale blue and a large pupil. The other hunter was freaked out a little and wanted to leave so they packed up but when they exited the blind the deer was closer just chewing and staring. He said the other hunter couldn't stop staring at the thing and it wasn't running so he approached it. When the hunter got close enough to touch it a long sticky black arm slowly like stretched out of the deer's mouth and started like caressing the guy's face. The dude who told me the story said the other hunter hit the ground after being touched and started convulsing while the thing kept climbing out the deer and touching the dude. He said it shot at the deer like two or three times and it ran off, 
and he got his buddy to the hospital and he ended no remembering anything and the doc said he had some freak seizer. What do y'all think? Weird old man telling porky apiece or is it a cryptid? Incident setting, Middle Tennessee, summer 2020, around 1 a.m. CST. It was the pandemic summer, and my two friends and I were dreadfully bored. The three of us spent a lot of time driving around, to Sonic or the miserable state of Iowa. We also went randonauting several times. Gas was cheap and it was fun to go down roads we had never turned onto before. On our third or fourth trip, we had done two very normal locations with goofy intentions set and saw nothing out of the ordinary. We decided to do one more location before calling it a night. We always had our perimeter set small, not wanting to go further than about 30 minutes out from our town. The third location, with the intention of just show us something gave us coordinates less than 5 minutes from my grandma's house, in a neighborhood. When we got to the location, there was nothing, it was a random road in a suburb, all was very quiet, dark, and normal. But as we went to leave, with the maps app guiding us, we ended up getting lost in the neighborhood. Somehow, we ended up coming up on the spot again, from the same direction as before. But this time, all three of us in the car saw a brightly shining gold figure in the middle of the road, probably 20 or so feet from the front of car. We were silent, until it moved to the side of the road, behind a car parked on the curb, and disappeared. Without addressing what we had just saw, all of us started to say we need to go almost simultaneously. It was until we were back on a main road that the question of did y'all see that too was finally raised. We all agreed on the limited features we saw, gold, glowing, about 4 feet tall, and no definable features on its orb slash cylindrical shape. We didn't know what to make of it then, and we still go hey remember when to each other now. After that night, we didn't go randonauting again, and my friend started hanging a cross necklace from her rear view mirror. None of us are the type to believe in physical manifestations of the supernatural, and I can't think of any rational explanation for what we saw that night. Details relating to what about X, we were all sober, the house it went towards had floodlights, they never came on, if it was a person in reflective clothing, it would have been an outline of a human figure, this shape had no discernible features as I mentioned, I don't really post on reddit, so if you have a recommendation for another subreddit this would better belong in, let me know. Other than that, just looking for ideas of what on earth we saw that night. Thanks. A couple of years ago, during the quiet solitude of a winter night, I found myself engrossed in a movie in my room. The clock had struck around 3 am when a peculiar sound interrupted the cinematic ambience, a laughter that echoed eerily, reminiscent of a jester's laugh. Intrigued and slightly unnerved, I decided to investigate the source of this uncanny sound. Venturing into my backyard, I directed my attention toward the area behind the house where the laughter seemed to originate. The sound persisted, rhythmic and punctuating the stillness of the night, always emanating from above a tree. The veil of darkness shrouded whatever entity might be responsible, and my attempts to discern its nature proved futile. Compounded by the fact that a winter storm was unfolding, with its gusty winds and icy precipitation, I retreated indoors, choosing to wait out the mysterious laughter. To my relief, the unnerving sound ceased, and the night returned to its usual calm. As dawn broke, I ventured outside to survey the aftermath of the storm. The pristine canvas of snow bore witness to the enigmatic visitor, leaving tracks that piqued my curiosity. Upon closer inspection, the tracks resembled those of an opossum or a raccoon imprinting their presence in the wintry landscape. Speculations swirled in my mind, and a hypothesis emerged, perhaps the elusive laughter had emanated from a creature native to Texas, where I resided. Could it have been an owl, a nocturnal denizen of the night known for its enigmatic calls? The tracks left behind suggested a terrestrial visitor, but the nocturnal symphony of Texas wildlife is a diverse tapestry, 
and the source of that mysterious laughter remains an unsolved riddle. If anyone familiar with the intricacies of Texas wildlife could provide insights or suggestions, it would be greatly appreciated. The laughter of that fateful night continues to echo in my memory, an enduring mystery shrouded in the wintry veil of a Texas storm. I was recently driving to work in the morning just before 8 a.m. in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. I had two other co-workers with me. I had a feeling recently of being followed or something when I saw this. One of my passengers said, look, a van and no driver. I could see no one driving the van behind me. It was following us and when I looked through the rear view mirror, there was no one on the driver's side. It was an inexpensive van, a Mercedes. It came up fast behind us several times, then sped off fast going south down the street after it passed us. When we looked over, no one was driving the van. Was it a ghost? There was no hint of an apparition. We thought someone was hiding while driving but it clearly wasn't. We were talking about it at work because we thought it was odd to see a ghost car. Clear windows and during a well-lit time of day. That afternoon, while driving home on the same highway, the same driverless van pulled up behind us. Once again it passed us and there was no one in the driver's seat. This occurred on I-44. I wonder if anyone else had the same experience? I was camping with my brother in Western Virginia in the mountains about 20 miles north of Virginia Tech. We had hiked up to a mountaintop and then stopped on the way back down at a saddle point in the mountains, there was a good flat spot. So we had finished dinner and headed into the tent and were talking a bit, about to drift off to sleep when it started. It was a beep. About every 20 seconds, although I didn't time it. Just a single beep, exactly like you would hear from a smoke detector that is low on battery. Except we were miles from any homes and of course we didn't have any smoke detectors with us. We discussed what it was and discussed going out and looking for it, but we were a bit freaked out by it. The beeping got louder and quieter, so it seemed like it was moving. After a while it got quieter and stopped, or we just drifted off to sleep. We talk about it sometimes still, call it the beeper. When I was 11 or 12, I spent a week with my family at Allegheny State Park in NY PA. One day, my two cousins, who were close in age, and I decided to embark on an adventurous hike along an 18-mile trail. Of course, we didn't entertain the idea that we'd actually make it that far, but the thrill of exploration fueled our journey. We ascended a mountain trail for two to three hours, eager to see where it would lead us. After what felt like a considerable distance, we arrived at a small level area on the trail. To our surprise, nestled right in the middle was a makeshift lean-to constructed from pine boughs. Inside this peculiar structure lay an unsettling discovery, around 30 squashed toad bodies. Two large, flat rocks served as a morbid stage, covered in the remains of these unfortunate creatures. The scene totally freaked us out. Questions raced through our minds. Who would hike all the way up there just to spend the day chasing and murdering toads? It sent shivers down our spines, and an eerie feeling settled over us. Without hesitation, we decided to head back down, our imaginations running wild with the unsettling image we had stumbled upon. Even now, the memory makes my skin crawl, leaving behind a lingering sense of unease. I recently got back from a backpacking trip in Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Park, and I have a good amount of experience in the backcountry and have never been spooked before. However, this trip was different. We spotted a picturesque swimming hole from a vista point on the highway and decided to hike down to it, but the trail was closed due to recent wildfires and we had to bushwhack our way the entire time me and three buddies. We get down to the river finally and the area is very secluded due to the steep river canyon walls that we had just hiked down. We notice a perfect campground set up, 
nice fire pit, area for tents, and a nice clearing. Next we notice something strange, a tent strewn across the ground, a backpack thrown open on the ground with all the pockets open and belongings on the ground in about 20 feet radius. There was also a sleeping bag rolled up but thrown into the bushes and barely visible. The absolute eeriest part though was the two pairs of new looking hiking boots perfectly placed on a large boulder. All the gear looked a little weathered, but not like it had been outside more than a week or two. We couldn't think of a logical reason why someone would leave this stuff, let alone their hiking boots. The trail up was very treacherous and boots were necessary. So we forget about the creepy gear and proceed to all do acid and hang out by the river. Things are all gravy until it gets dark and we must walk through the abandoned campsite. This is when we all get spooky vibes, and even though no one says it outright, we were all thinking about if whatever was responsible for the sketchy condition of the camp would come back. We never came up with a rational conclusion, but we did feel the horror movie vibes all night. When I was a kid, six years old or so, I was out camping with my dad in Wilson's Promontory, Australia. We were luckily the only campsite in the clearing as it can get pretty busy down there. Anyway I woke up sometime around 2 or 3 am and realized I needed to pee. So I crawled out of my sleeping bag and made my way to the end of the tent. After not so gracefully getting out of the small two-man tent I walked off towards the bushland that was bordering the clearing and prepared to squat and get on with it. The clearing was semi-lit by the moon this night so while my eyes were adjusting I could see shadows of the trees and the tent but not much else. In my half-asleep days I had my back to the trees and was facing the tent and the clearing. I heard the noise of my sweet release making a small puddle between my legs followed by a rustle of leaves behind me. I tried to turn around and see what was behind me but my eyes couldn't focus on anything but was a few feet in front of me. I stained my bladder to finish up already while the crackling of dried twigs being snaped underfoot started to get louder and closer. By this point my heart was hammering in my chest and all I wanted to do was get into bed. I then heard this grunt like nothing I had ever heard before it sounded like heavy raspy breathing. I started to run towards the tent pulling up my pants as I screamed for my dad for help. I looked behind me and saw a wombat running towards me making this horrible grunting noise. I ended up getting onto our small table out of front of the tent and by the time looked around to see where the grumpy F was he was stumbling back away from the tent and back to where he came from. When I was younger, around 16 to 17, I spent most of my summer breaks at my grandparents' house, taking care of my great-grandma while they were out of town. She couldn't be left alone, and I enjoyed spending time with her and assisting her. We devoted a considerable amount of time to watching Ghost Hunters on Demand, as it was one of my favorite shows, and she was always up for watching new shows with me. Throughout the show, she would comment on everything, exclaiming, look, they found a ghosty. However, she remained skeptical at the end, asserting, that couldn't happen, ghosts aren't real. When you die, that's it. You just go to heaven. I would always counter, saying, well, grandma, how would you know that? You're still alive. To which she'd respond, well, when I die, I'll let you know. About two years later, in 2011, while I was home from college for Thanksgiving break, my great-grandma passed away at the age of 93. I was heartbroken. After her funeral, I returned to school, trying to carry on as best as I could. About a month later, I was watching TV in my dorm room. My roommate and my sweet mates had all gone home for a weekend, and I stayed to take advantage of the silence. I had been channel surfing for most of the night and came across a show about ghost hunting. I watched it for a bit and decided to change the channel. However, the remote suddenly stopped working. I replaced the batteries with brand new ones, straight out of the box, but it wouldn't work. Finally, I decided to unplug the TV. Strangely enough, the TV was still on. At this point, I felt a chill down my spine 
and the hanging blinds, drawn closed with the windows closed and locked, began to ripple and move. Mind you, everything in the room was shut and locked up tight. Nothing could have been making those blinds move like that. I stood in the middle of the room, a bit scared, but I also felt an overwhelming sense of comfort and familiarity. Grandma, I said, while holding back tears, I know it's you. Thank you for letting me know you're here, but you're kind of scaring me. Can you please stop? Suddenly, everything stopped. The blinds were still, and the TV shut off. Nothing like that ever happened again in that room. About a year later, I switched schools and moved in with my grandparents. I slept in my great-grandma's old room, and at night, I would hear her say, Angel, in my ear. In my half-asleep state, I could feel her hand stroking my hair, and I would feel so safe and comforted. My family and I were staying at a cabin in some woods with neighbors nearby. It was pretty rural. The cabin had two stories with a hanging roof over the side of the first floor. This meant that from my window, I would have been able to climb onto a roof outcropping from the window without a very big drop. The shingles almost lined up with the window sill. Anyways, it was the middle of summer so I decided to open my window because of how hot it was in the room I was staying in. My parents had the room on the same side of the house and also had the window open. There was a river nearby, so we didn't hear each other snoring or whatnot. I went to sleep, and for whatever reason, my mom couldn't fall asleep until 2 in the morning or so. She asked me the next morning if I had heard that sound outside my window late at night. Confused, I had her explain what it sounded like. She told me it was scratching on the window frame with its claws, and began to let out a low growl that didn't sound like a cat or mountain lion. After the noises outside of my window stopped, she heard a muffled pounding of some large animal running on the roof, and then it stopped and she didn't hear anything but the river anymore. It's still really creepy to think that I slept through this as it happened right outside my window, possibly trying to get in. Frontiersmen are not, as a rule, apartment to be very superstitious. They lead lives too hard and practical and have too little imagination in things spiritual and supernatural. I have heard but few ghost stories while living on the frontier, and those few are of a perfectly commonplace and conventional type. But I once listened to a goblin story, which rather impressed me. A grizzled, weather-beaten old mountain hunter, named Bauman who, was born and had passed all of his life on the frontier, told it the story to me. He must have believed what he said, for he could hardly repress a shudder at certain points of the tale, but he was of German ancestry, and in childhood had doubtless been saturated with all kinds of ghost and goblin lore. So that many fearsome superstitions were latent in his mind, besides, he knew well the stories told by the Indian medicine men in their winter camps, of the snow walkers, and the specters, spirits, ghosts and apparitions, the formless evil beings that haunt the forest depths, and dog and waylay the lonely wanderer who after nightfall passes through the regions where they lurk. It may be that when overcome by the horror of the fate that befell his friend, and when oppressed by the awful dread of the unknown, he grew to attribute, both at the time and still more in remembrance, weird and elfin traits to what was merely some abnormally wicked and cunning wild beast, but whether this was so or not, no man can say. When the event occurred, Bauman was still a young man and was trapping with a partner among the mountains dividing the forks of the salmon from the head of Wisdom River. Not having had much luck, he and his partner determined to go up into a particularly wild and lonely pass through which ran a small stream said to contain many beaver. The pass had an evil reputation because the year before a solitary hunter who had wandered into it was slain, seemingly by a wild beast, the half-eaten remains being afterward found by some mining prospectors who had passed his camp only the night before. The memory of this event, however, weighted very lightly with the two trappers, who were as adventurous and hardy as others of their kind. They took their two lean mountain ponies to the foot of the pass where they left them in an open beaver meadow, 
the rocky timber clad ground being from there onward impracticable for horses. They then struck out on foot through the vast, gloomy forest, and in about four hours reached a little open glade where they concluded to camp, as signs of game were plenty. There was still an hour or two of daylight left, and after building a brush lean-to and throwing down and opening their packs, they started upstream. The country was very dense and hard to travel through, as there was much down timber, although here and there the somber woodland was broken by small glades of mountain grass. At dusk they again reached camp. The glade in which it was pitched was not many yards wide, the tall, close-set pines and firs rising round it like a wall. On one side was a little stream, beyond which rose the steep mountain slope, covered with the unbroken growth of evergreen forest. They were surprised to find that during their absence something, apparently a bear, had visited the camp, and had rummaged about among their things, scattering the contents of their packs, and in sheer wantonness destroying their lean-to. The footprints of the beast were quite plain, but at first, they paid no particular heed to them, busying themselves with rebuilding the lean-to, laying out their beds and stores, and lighting the fire. While Bauman was making ready supper, it being already dark, his companion began to examine the tracks more closely, and soon took a brand from the fire to follow them up, where the intruder had walked along a game trail after leaving the camp. When the brand flickered out, he returned and took another, repeating his inspection of the footprints very closely. Coming back to the fire, he stood by it a minute or two, peering out into the darkness, and suddenly remarked, Bauman, that bear has been walking on two legs. Bauman laughed at this, but his partner insisted that he was right, and upon again examining the tracks with a torch, they certainly did seem to be made by but two paws or feet. However, it was too dark to make sure. After discussing whether the footprints could possibly be those of a human being, and coming to the conclusion that they could not be, the two men rolled up in their blankets and went to sleep under the lean-to. At midnight Bauman was awakened by some noise and sat up in his blankets. As he did so his nostrils were struck by a strong, wild beast odor, and he caught the loom of a great body in the darkness at the mouth of the lean-to. Grasping his rifle, he fired at the vague, threatening shadow, but must have missed, for immediately afterward he heard the smashing of the underwood as the thing, whatever it was, rushed off into the impenetrable blackness of the forest and the night. After this, the two men slept but little, sitting up by the rekindled fire, but they heard nothing more. In the morning they started out to look at the few traps they had set the previous evening and put out new ones. By an unspoken agreement, they stayed together all day and returned to camp towards evening. On nearing it they saw, hardly to their astonishment that the lean-to had again been torn down. The visitor of the preceding day had returned, and in wanton malice had tossed about their camp kit and bedding, and destroyed the shanty. The ground was marked up by its tracks, and on leaving the camp it had gone along the soft earth by the brook. The footprints were as plain as if on snow, and, after a careful scrutiny of the trail, it certainly did seem as if, whatever the thing was, it had walked off on but two legs. The men, thoroughly uneasy, gathered a great heap of dead logs and kept up a roaring fire throughout the night, one or the other sitting on guard most of the time. About midnight the thing came down through the forest opposite, across the brook, and stayed there on the hillside for nearly an hour. They could hear the branches crackle as it moved about, and several times it uttered a harsh, grating, long-drawn moan, a peculiarly sinister sound. Yet it did not venture near the fire. In the morning the two trappers, after discussing the strange events of the last 36 hours, decided that they would shoulder their packs and leave the valley that afternoon. They were the more ready to do this because in spite of seeing a good deal of game sign, they had caught very little fur. However it was necessary first to go along the line of their traps and gather them, and this they started out to do. All the morning they kept together, picking up trap after trap, each one empty. On first leaving camp they had the disagreeable sensation of being followed. In the dense spruce thickets, they occasionally heard a branch snap after they had passed, 
and now and then there were slight rustling noises among the small pines to one side of them. At noon they were back within a couple of miles of camp. In the high, bright sunlight their fears seemed absurd to the two armed men, accustomed as they were, through long years of lonely wandering in the wilderness, to face every kind of danger from man, brute or element. There were still three beaver traps to collect from a little pond in a wide ravine nearby. Bauman volunteered to gather these and bring them in, while his companion went ahead to camp and made ready the packs. On reaching the pond Bauman found three beavers in the traps, one of which had been pulled loose and carried into a beaver house. He took several hours to secure and prepare the beaver, and when he started homewards he marked, with some uneasiness, how low the sun was getting. As he hurried toward camp, under the tall trees, the silence and desolation of the forest weighed on him. His feet made no sound on the pine needles and the slanting sun rays, striking through among the straight trunks, made a gray twilight in which objects at a distance glimmered indistinctly. There was nothing to break the gloomy stillness which, when there is no breeze, always broods over these somber primeval forests. At last, he came to the edge of the little glade where the camp lay and shouted as he approached it, but got no answer. The campfire had gone out, though the thin blue smoke was still curling upwards. Near it lay the packs wrapped and arranged. At first, Bauman could see nobody, nor did he receive an answer to his call. Stepping forward he again shouted, and as he did so his eye fell on the body of his friend, stretched beside the trunk of a great fallen spruce. Rushing towards it the horrified trapper found that the body was still warm, but that the neck was broken, while there were four great fang marks in the throat. The footprints of the unknown beast creature, printed deep in the soft soil, told the whole story. The unfortunate man, having finished his packing, had sat down on the spruce log with his face to the fire, and his back to the dense woods, to wait for his companion. While thus waiting, his monstrous assailant, who must have been lurking in the woods, waiting for a chance to catch one of the adventurers unprepared, came silently up from behind, walking with long noiseless steps and seemingly still on two legs. Evidently unheard, it reached the man and broke his neck by wrenching his head back with its four paws, while it buried its teeth in his throat. It had not eaten the body, but apparently had romped and gambled around it in uncouth, ferocious glee, occasionally rolling over and over it, and had then fled back into the soundless depths of the woods. Bauman, utterly unnerved and believing that the creature with which he had to deal was something either half-human or half-devil, some great goblin beast, abandoned everything but his rifle and struck off at speed down the pass, not halting until he reached the beaver meadows where the hobbled ponies were still grazing. Mounting, he rode onwards through the night, until beyond reach of pursuit. I was in Iraq in 2007 as an AAV mechanic. Back then there weren't fancy armored glass kits so we had Mad Max some HMMWV windows to act as protection for the driver and the troop commander seats. I was in the troop commander seat since we didn't have troops mounted up and it was right behind the driver. We were on a dirt road and I was sitting up out of the vehicle at about stomach height mainly overconfident in said patch job windows when out of nowhere I got the feeling that it wasn't a good idea. As soon as I clicked the seat down to the lowest position so that only my head was out of the vehicle we hit an IED. It completely shredded the armor on the side of the vehicle and we never found the window. So instead of possibly being dead from losing an arm or worse I only got a busted eardrum out of the deal. I also hit an IED a week after and a third one a month to the day of the first one but I didn't sense those. Maybe cause I wasn't near the impact of those two? Who knows? Hi. I'm from East Long Island, New York, and single. One night in the summer of 2016 I was lying in bed unable to sleep when a very bright white light entered the room. Then several humanoids appeared in my bedroom and stood by my bed. These beings were about 4 foot tall, wide in the torso, with large heads, large black eyes, 
no ears, or hair with dark bluish-gray skin. Their hands were very wide with thick fingers and nails. They wore white robes down to the floor. They asked me to come with them and I followed them down to the street. There I saw a group of women, maybe two dozen or so, slowly walking down the street. All appeared to be in a trance and were going in the direction of the beach. I also felt drawn to the water. When I got there, I observed four brightly lit disc-shaped objects hovering over the surface. A tall beautiful female with pale skin and wearing a long flowing black hooded robe appeared in front of me. I was called by this being and asked to conduct a test. I soon found myself standing by the foot of my bed with the stocky beings attempting to stick me with a long needle. It was inserted into my upper chest and an opaque yellow liquid was extruded from me. I remember waking mid-morning the next day with a terrible headache. I have no idea why this occurred. I couldn't find any marks, but I did experience intense dizzy spells and had problems eating some days. I lost about 50 pounds during the next 4 month period and was hospitalized for one week while tests were being conducted on me. I did not relate my experience with anyone, not even the doctors. The results of the test did not result in a diagnosis. Over the past 6 years, my body and appearance have drastically changed. Some people say that I am looking and acting much younger. There is no explanation. I was driving back from university with my mom. We had taken this trip millions of times, and there were never any issues. However, this time, while we were driving, we hit what I can only describe as a time bubble. The road had completely transformed, pitch black, devoid of lights, and with no sign of life. The road markers were gone, and the road signs that remained had been blacked out, reminiscent of what they did in World War II in case of invasion. Even the smell of the area was different, and a massive amount of fog appeared. It felt eerily calm, and no matter which direction we drove, we ended up at the same junction. For hours, we circled around this mysterious spot until, suddenly, the last time we exited the junction, there were lights, cars, and signs of normalcy. I cannot explain it, and whenever we talk about it, it seems even more insane. When we checked the clock, only minutes had passed, but the mileage records on my car indicated that we had traveled about 60 miles. I've never felt more confused in my life, and each time we brought it up, people just laughed, dismissing our experience as if we were crazy. I never drove that way again. So, it's kind of paranormal, but when I was growing up, my dad was obsessed with Civil War history, so family trips always consisted of visiting battlefields. On this particular trip, we went to Antietam and stayed at a B&B, a historic farmhouse that had served as a Civil War field hospital. It was owned by an officer in the Confederate Army. Everything was fine until about midway through the night when my brother and I woke up to my mom panicking in the other room. She had basically jumped out of bed and run to wake us all up. When we asked her what happened, she explained that she was having trouble falling asleep due to how cold the room was, and this was the south in the summer, mind you. Then, all of a sudden, she was convinced someone was waiting outside the bedroom door, so she called out, thinking it was my dad or something. Moments later, she felt something standing over her in the bed, and frozen with fear, my mom couldn't move. She started to get tucked into bed, as if fingers were pressing the bedding tightly around her body. After the tucking, something brushed her cheek and then was gone. The room was warm again, and my mom lost it, jumping out of bed. We checked the bed, and there were visible tuck marks, like the outline of my mom's body was still present in the bed even after she had gotten up. To this day, it's something in my family none of us can explain. We all saw the tuck marks, and we even have photos of it. My dad swears it wasn't him, and my brother and I were sleeping in the same room, so I know he didn't do it. Sometimes I go out to the bow of the ship and look at the stars. 
Nothing really can compare when you see the Milky Way and shit. But I was looking at these stars that formed a triangle shape. The next thing I know the triangles rotate. The triangle is upside down now and I ask my friend who's up there with me if he sees the upside down triangle he says oh yeah there. The triangle rotates to its original position. And he continued. What the F? I asked if he saw what I saw and he said he did. Weird man. Of course no one in the ship believed us. Haven't been in this situation for a while, but in the mid 2000s I was in the Navy. I was on a small buoy, 187 feet long, 31 feet wide if I remember right. I might not have, purposely or not. Anyway, the general dimensions are close enough to bank on, but, I was on a fairly small boat and we were in 12 feet seas. To those that don't understand seas, you have a trough and a crest, the midpoint is where you measure from, so that meant at the bottom of the trough, there was 24 feet of water above us. Scariest thing I've ever seen. We had the fantail closed because if we had a man overboard it would have been man dead. With that being said, I saw some strange things. The lights and such can be explained I guess, but it was more than that. The sea can let you know you aren't alone, or wanted, but before it was closed I had a chance to stand on the fantail and witness the phenomenon. There were lights in the sea. Plankton, other weird things? Possibly. But it was like seeing a several level Christmas tree presentation, and it was mesmerizing. I've seen more than one explanation video for what I saw, but it doesn't do it justice. Looking on a wall of water that could wipe you out in an instant is something that is hard to explain, and I can't even try to tell you what I saw out there. It was nature at its most majestic. I guess, join the small boy navy and chill to reap crazy Bermuda Triangle rumors as well as whatever else is said, and then, party. I was in the navy, stationed on my ship with my duty buddy while I was off work. The weather took a turn for the worse, and what started as a bad day quickly escalated. The duty officer of the deck, O.O.D., a tiny black girl with the thickest Louisiana accent you'd ever heard, began frantically issuing emergency weather commands over the PA system. In the midst of the chaos, the ship shore power lines were violently pulled from the ship as our moor lines succumbed to the relentless weather. I could only imagine the arc and spark show that ensued. However, for my duty buddy and me, who were nonchalantly enjoying beef bowls in my shop, all systems abruptly died. The ship fell into immediate silence, and darkness enveloped us for a few moments. Experiencing utter and complete silence on a vessel, with all systems offline, is something you never expect. It sends chills down your spine. The sudden hush in the midst of the storm left an indelible mark on my memory, a stark reminder of the unpredictable nature of the sea and the eerie moments it can bring. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe for daily stories. We at Horror Den of Misfits really enjoy this, and your support would be appreciated.